pick a spot, use the right pin, make sure that you know the yardage. I shot and uh, the deer blows out of there. You've waited your whole life for this moment. Anything to do with Western Big Game. Welcome to the Epic Outdoors podcast, powered by Under Armour. Hey everybody, Jason Carter here and Adam Bronson with the Epic Outdoors podcast. Uh, we got a special guest lined up for you today. Um, it's a guy that uh, we've had a lot of requests for us to you know, interview on our podcast, and it's a guy that I've ha- I have a ton of respect for. I've known him for, geez, since, since basically I've started hunting, same with Adam. And uh, anyway, we're way excited to jump into this podcast with him. Um, it's Randy Ulmer, as well as killing many giant bucks, bulls, and, and everything else he hunts. Randy was, uh, inducted into the Bow Hunters Hall of Fame approximately 20 years ago. And, and as recently as 2016, he was inducted to the Archery Hall of Fame. So, I mean, the, the credentials behind Randy are endless. And I know there's a lot that we can learn from him. Of course, you know, we could probably have a 10 hour podcast with Randy and still not, and still be taking away things that would help us in our hunting careers. And so we're super excited to get into it with him. But before we get started, um, do want to thank Under Armour for sponsoring these podcasts, as well as some of the different projects we've got going on. They're a super great company. They've supported us for years and years, and, and we appreciate them. And this is the time of year that all the different conventions are going to be taking place. Um, people will be gathering, prepping for next year's hunts. Here in Utah, we have the Hunt Expo. It's one of our biggest conventions of the year. It's a time where uh, it seems like the entire state of Utah gets together, as well as surrounding states, and just visits about hunting. A lot of booths there, a lot of different tags to buy. There'll be tags to apply for. There's a bunch of dis- different conservation tags that are available for five bucks a piece, and you can come and you got to validate them in person, and then it's a good excuse to come around and visit with everybody at the booth. Speaking of booths, we're going to be at booth number 2845. So the Hunt Expo will take place February 8th to the 11th, 2018. And on February 10th, there at the Hunt Expo, there is also a meeting with the Full Curl Society, February 10th. And uh, they will be giving away 10 sheep hunts, fully paid. So the winner's not even needing to put up a small fee. There'll be three stone sheep hunts, five doll sheep hunts given away, as well as a desert sheep hunt and a Rocky Mountain Bighorn. And so, anyway, it's a great opportunity for guys to apply, basically, for for hunts that otherwise cost lots of thousands of dollars. And uh, you can sign up. You can get tickets at www.fullcurl.org. And a uh, great opportunity for guys to, to win some hunts. There'll be 10 hunt winners in the room February 10th during the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. As we get started here, uh, I'm going to let it, Randy talk. We got him on the line with us, but... Again, I do want to introduce him um, a little bit further. Randy is is somebody that's killed, I don't know how many deer, over 200-inch type deer with a bow, um, but it's numerous, maybe as many or more than anybody else I know. And uh, and he's just, he's a class act. Um, He's known in the industry for being just one of the best archers to to have ever lived so as well as mule deer he's killed amazing elk as we all know we've seen giant 400 inch bulls that randy's knocked down seems like year after year after year so anyway uh really appreciate you randy uh being on with us and taking us taking a little time with us here today well thanks for having me i'm honored to be with you guys you bet so maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got started into this this hunting career that you've got going and and of course uh all your shooting your shooting competitions and i just i don't even know where to start there's so much uh depth behind randy elmer well jason i think i started out a lot like you uh we came from well i came from a really small town in in uh Eastern Arizona, uh, Taylor, which no one knows where it is, but a very small community and, uh, you know, grew up kind of out in the country and uh, had my first bow when I was six years old and just shot that and shot that and shot that hunting rabbits and birds and doves and quail and that sort of thing. And, and uh, it just progressed, uh, came from a hunting family. We, we hunted every fall, uh, mainly for me, we never really were trophy hunters at all. And uh, my brother and I uh, started bow hunting in our teens, and and uh, 
you know, I just had a great time with it. And, and, uh, so bow hunting has always been my passion. My dad didn't really bow hunt at all. Um, we all gun hunted and, and, uh, when Rusty and I, Rusty actually picked up the, the compound first and started hunting. And then I, I started the next year and, and, uh, basically been going ever since. And, uh, and bow hunting is what started my target career. Actually, I, I, uh, joined a bow hunting league and, and, uh, Rusty and I, my Rusty's my brother, and uh, we had just shot together. We'd never, we'd been self-taught, shot together for years, and really didn't know if we were good or bad. Or, <laughs> and then when we joined the bow hunting league, we found out we were actually pretty good. So uh, we started shooting competition, and it kind of just went from there. And so, just self-taught, pretty much, or is it something? I mean, did you have lessons from anybody or any books back then that you guys read about about how to hold this thing or? Let no, the string we go. were actually, actually completely self-taught. We went into a, a little store and, and bought, uh, well, he bought a compound, then I bought a camp compound the next year. And uh, that year, uh, we upgraded arrows. We bought, we were we were very uh, poor back then, and so we bought one dozen 2219 arrows, uh, <laughs> which are heavy as rocks. And uh, <laughs> we just practiced in the sand dune all that summer, and by hunting season, uh you know, they started out at, I can't remember, they're black or, or dark olive color. And by the time hunting season rolls, rolled around, they were completely silver uh, from the point to the fletching because of being shot through the sand so much. <laughs> We'd worn off the anodizing. And uh, that first hunting trip we did, uh, uh, you could shoot cow elk back then. And, oh, by, by the first evening, I'd shot all six of my arrows, <laughs> gone back and found a couple of them, straightened them. <laughs> went over my knee, shot him again, and I hadn't hit anything. And that evening, uh, I was out of arrows, and I was begging Rusty to give me an arrow. He said, I'll give you some tomorrow, but I, I, why don't you come hunting with me? So anyway, he shot a bull that evening at about 35 yards, hit him way back, and, and uh, this bull wandered over about 30 yards and just fell over. He had hit the descending aorta way back and, wow. and we, we both looked at the <laughs> wow. bow and go, oh man this is magical we've never <laughs> seen an elk drop with a rifle that quickly so anyway uh, we obviously were hooked and uh the arrows were probably doing 150 feet a second or i don't even know uh, back yeah then. maybe <laughs> and you know those bows well it was a rainbow we really couldn't shoot over 30 yards because there was no range finders you just had to guess and we, weren't, we were new to it so yeah. uh it, it, it was just i mean it was so much fun it was just so much fun being out there chasing. Were you guys in high school? Is that roughly the age 16? Or no, so? we were just out of high school. We were okay. in college. I what, gotcha. uh, not the day year or anything, Randy, but like what year are we roughly talking? It just We're roughly talking about the late 70s. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, you've been, in a, you've been at this a while. <laughs> I, mean, just, it's I don't just, like the way you laugh when you no, say that. <laughs> no, no. I just mean, like, it just shows how much depth. Like, you've seen everything. You've seen everything from the old Easton game getters. Clear back, you know, I had a Carol bow back in Me what, too. Low, early 80s. I shot 80s. Carol's, too, when I was, you know, Well, you know, you, you, if you still had that, it'd be worth some love. I know, and you know what? I, I, I couldn't get rid of it fast enough, and they actually um, – you know, and I, and I love the bow, but I mean, as far as once technology started changing and I, and it was, uh, I believe it was like hand painted. It had bright, bright green aspen leaves, You brightest green aspen leaves paint from top to bottom. Like that's all mm-hmm. I, re- I remember about it. Um, I remember mine it had a matte black riser, but the limbs were black, but gloss, the highest gloss, like the worst bow hunting bow look you could have <laughs> it was a great looking bow and i shot you know shot um you know first deer and elk yeah. with that bow it was you know i'd tape it up and all that but i just i was wondering when we went hunting why did they well, make that, this that solid gloss uh, you know yeah. <laughs> that, that equipment uh it, it was good because it made you hunt a long time before you killed anything. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so yeah. you got your bow hunting skills down. <laughs> oh yeah, there's no doubt about that. The bending the arrows over the knees and oh, that's close enough for you know what I'm hunting. I've we've all been there, done that back in that day. And so, did you, uh, as you were going going forward in your early youth? I mean, were you still trying the gun or using the gun a bit? I mean, you know, I know your dad, you mentioned your dad was kind of a rifle hunter, but you guys, did you guys hunt with a rifle also, or you just know, pretty much just be addicted to the bow? I kind of switched over fairly quickly. Um, and that's not to say I didn't use a rifle, but I think, 
mostly for, for the most part, by the time the early eighties rolled around, I was pretty much a dedicated bow hunter. Now, Rusty, my brother, uh, is a coos deer fanatic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to quote him, he said he, he would, he would use hand grenades on coos deer <laughs> if he could, cause they're so hard to kill or find no, and kill. So he still hunts. The only thing I think he hunts with the rifle is coos deer, but he pretty much hunts coos deer every year with the rifle. And, uh, yeah. but no, I transitioned fair fairly quickly now my family like my wife and and uh, one of my sons still hunt with rifles i got nothing against it i actually yeah it's kind of a nice change because you know you guys have both been there you guys have been bow hunters each of you for at least 20 years so you know that you know you 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 bow hunt long enough you get so frustrated just like sometimes if i had a rifle you'd be dead yeah, and if yeah. you go out there and, and your kid or your wife or your buddy has a rifle and you're going, oh, this is going to be so sweet. <laughs> yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll be home by dinner. <laughs> well, and I've had, uh, you know, I actually had a guy that um, professes to just be a bow hunter, strictly a bow hunter. And he came up to me and I'd killed a wolf in Idaho. And um, he's like, you know, I'd love to kill a wolf. Like, I would love to kill a wolf. But he says, I've just resolved that I, my, to myself that I'm not going to kill one because I can't kill one with a bow. We, and I just thought, man, kind of a bummer, you know, like go kill one with a rifle or, or what? I, you know what I mean? If you want a wolf to, but to box yourself into that corner, you know. That well, you, you know, it's, and it's, a, it, it's, you know, sometimes I think, because I've analyzed that myself because I think oh, my brother's going to Mexico to hunt coos deer and, and in that country it's pretty much impossible sure. to kill one with a bow. You'd, and I thought, you know, it would be fun just to go down there and hunt with a gun. And, and then I analyze what's my reasoning behind not doing that. And I think as much as I hate to admit this, I think as a bow hunter, you know, and especially if you've, if you've had just a little bit of notoriety or all your buddies know that you're, hey, I'm strictly a bow hunter yeah. i really think it's peer pressure yeah i think why if i want to go shoot a, a coos deer in mexico with a gun and go have fun with my brother why don't why I? Can't I yeah and 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 i think you know what really it's because i'm afraid of what other people will say and it might <laughs> that's a terrible that's a terrible thing to Randy, say if you want to shoot really, a gun point, if you want to shoot a gun you should go shoot one because quite frankly everybody knows you're the number one archer You've that's been it. raised it in the couldn't, last 30 it, years. Uh, like, it's not a competition. It couldn't taint it. it. All the girls. <laughs> <laughs> this, this I don't. I don't. If you've listened to a podcast, have not said what I just said to you. And it's and it's true. Yeah, your, it's true. your success, uh, yeah, I mean, is proof of, of what you've done. And so, anyway, I just think, yeah, if you want to shoot, you should be able to. But I, I totally know what you mean. We all do things out of peer pressure. Sometimes we're shooting long range. Um, even if you're shooting long range archery, you might not profess to do it, but I know, Randy, I know you can shoot 150 yards, You, but you might not come out and print and say, I shoot 150 yards. You know what I'm saying? Or willing to shoot 150 yards. But as far well, as the targets, you, you, there's no, I mean, you have to be able to shoot that far because you're, you're, you look at the competitions you're winning and, and what you're doing. And, and so those are fine lines that you might not talk about. You know, well, you know, here's the deal. And, and, and most people assume that I shoot at at things at long yardage because, you know, because of my competition because background. You're capable. But yeah. here, here, here's the deal, though. And, and you guys know this because you guys are both very accomplished bow hunters. Um, yeah. Say say, you know, I, and I do shoot at 120 yards at home. Yes. However, and you know what? 100. Well, at 120 yards, I'm very proficient. However. In a hunting situation, there are so many things that can go wrong. That deer yeah. can take a step. There can be a gust of wind. And at 120 yards, I don't care how good you are. Your chances of wounding an animal are extremely high. And I spend, oh, like this summer I spent 45 days scouting for deer. And so I find I found two really big bucks yeah. in my scouting. And, uh, and, and that's pretty much the same every year. And so – I've got this deer that I've invested and both of those deer I'd, I'd followed. Now, now one of those deer, uh, a really good friend of mine in Colorado, Steve, uh, Winery had found the year before on a sheep hunt. Uh, but anyway, that, that's neither here nor there. I spent 45 days scouting. So I find this one deer, follow that deer. We've been following those two deers, those two deer for two years. Okay. So am I going to go out there and shoot at that deer at 80 yards? And even at 80 yards is a, it, it, I consider when I shoot a deer, I want, 
I want at least a 90% chance that not I'm all going to hit him, but I'm going to kill him and I'm going to kill him now because otherwise if if worst thing I wound him, he's gone. Or if I scare him, you know how these eight year old bucks Mm -hmm. are. Um, you scare them, you know, it's going to be another four days before you see them. So my limit, I have a a very hard limit and that's 60 yards. Cause if I don't get within 60 yards and he's standing broadside, there's no wind. Um, I'm not going to shoot because I, I've got so many days invested in that deer. You'll just wait another day or two or five until it comes together. And and you know, you know, one thing when I was younger, I always thought, well, this is the only time I'm ever going to see that buck because he's so brilliant because he's got big antlers that I'm never going to find him yet. I need to do something now. And as you know, both of you know, you that deer is not going to disappear. Right. You know, he may disappear for a day, sometimes right. two or three of this deer I shot this year disappeared for four days, yeah. but they're going to come back. You're yeah. going to find them. If you're again. the only one hunting so them, you why, probably are going to get If you've got 45 pack. days invested in them, why not invest another four? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I got off tangent a little bit there. No, but, that's perfect. But I, I've got real strong feelings on that. Well, I think it's awesome, and I think it, you know, it's uh, it just a, a test, a testament to your ethics and and whatnot, and why you've been so successful in doing what it's you're doing. It's not a test of my ethics; it's a test of my a testament to my greed over big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of reversed, probably, when a lot of people think. Most people would think when you get within eighty, you better let one fly, because that's your only chance of killing yeah. a deer. Where you have a different philosophy of. As, you know, as long as you're, you know, that you're the one hunting the deer and, and it's you and him, so to speak, if it's not right, back out, let it, let it try to happen tomorrow. The next day, eventually you're going to get your break yeah. in your wheelhouse in that 90% zone, as you call it. And he's going to, he's going to be in trouble. And on this tangent, when I went off on that, you were capable of shooting that far. Anybody, most bow hunters that are capable of shooting that far tell people that i'm capable of shooting that far and that's all they people do. assume that they're going to shoot that far and uh and if there's anybody that's capable of shooting long distance it'd be you and and yet um you know a lot of times you're not willing to do to to take those shots and i think it's awesome i think it's great so so, so randy after i guess through your college years and whatnot i, I know you're a veterinarian i know you uh uh that's what you've done i guess for uh, practice and profession and whatnot did you stick around you've been in arizona most of your life and and that kind i mean i know you're there now still so did you always kind of after college come back stick there and that's where you've based your roots yeah after after veterinary school i went and did uh some work at texas a&m uh you know postdoctoral work there um and then i came back here and started practice uh and yeah so arizona my family's been in arizona here for I don't know, four or five generations on both sides. So this is kind of our home. And, and uh, you know, Arizona, a lot like Southern Utah, Arizona's got a lot to offer. You, oh, my God. Oh, you, yeah. you know, I, I feel hunting. blessed. Of course, yeah. everyone's kind of uh, partial to their home, but I feel really blessed here. We just have so many uh, outdoor opportunities. Uh, you know, like you guys do in Utah, there's just, you can hunt so many species and you can just go out and have fun. And, you know, we have, we have it nice here because we can, well, you guys are kind of the same way right there. You can be down in St. George where it's warm all winter. Um, and, and, uh, you know, in two hours you can be up at, at 10,000 feet and, and we're the same way here. Mm-hmm. Big variety. That's right. Well, it doesn't hurt that, you know, you got giant bucks and bulls and rams and everything else in your home state and, uh, you know, drawing tags, you know, no waiting periods on your elk tags and all those little things are nice benefits. If you're a serious trophy hunter and then you live right next to states like you know utah you know new mexico nevada which we all know you've spent a lot of time in and yeah nothing wrong with we're living in the in the southwest well no you know within 10 hours of me i can hunt in new mexico i can hunt in nevada i can hunt in utah i can hunt in colorado and and uh it's you know it really isn't isn't bad at all And, and you know i couldn't have picked now, there may be a better time in the future, but I doubt it. But I couldn't have picked a better time to have, you know, if, if you want to be a bow hunter, uh, to have uh, been born and raised in Arizona, which, you know, up until 10, 15 years ago was the best state to kill big bull. Now, you guys have kind of took that uh, crown for, for the last 10 years. But, but really, you know, uh, you, you couldn't have lived in a better place to have opportunities at truly giant bulls than, than having, uh, you know, been raised in Arizona. 
Yeah, there's no question. And uh, and and still, even though you know we do have some good animals here, we it feels like a once in a lifetime tag to be able to hunt some of our units. And so, Adam and I and everybody else that lives in the state have have a tendency to be looking across the border a little bit and really you know trying to get tags in Arizona, trying to get tags in Nevada, or try, or going into Mexico and. And so that that is what's nice about being centrally located. You get to look around, but you know, and guys like you have have spent your time out scouting, and you've got a lot of opportunity. It just feels like you got a lot of opportunities in your home state to be able to draw fairly regular. Even even the easier to draw units have giant bull potential for guys like you that are putting in their time. Oh yeah, a couple. Of, I mean, you, you talk about what they call limited opportunity areas. You know, if you're willing to go into one of those areas and you know it well, and you're willing to spend, you know, three or four weeks in there, uh, there are some giant bulls. Yeah. And uh, now we, our our game and fish department has has started managing a little bit more for opportunity. Well, a whole lot more for opportunity. So it isn't as good as it was even five years ago and, and especially as good as it was 10 years ago and 20 years ago, as you guys well know, well, you guys keep killing big bulls in New Mexico. I don't know how you're doing it, but, uh, you know, New Mexico, New Mexico, <laughs> with rifles, with well, rifles. archery a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, is, that is one way I've limited myself, but no, but you guys kill, you know, I mean, and other people kill some big bulls still in New Mexico, but 20 years ago, I mean, you guys remember, uh, there were just, really good bulls over there and it yeah. wasn't that hard to get a tag and of course they've changed their draw system as you guys well know but yeah. so it's almost impossible for a non-resident to get a tag you know unless you buy a landowner buy a land tag owner. but the, yeah. there's they've i think they've kind of overdone that land, landowner tag and the system because it seems like there's too many but anyway it doesn't seem like the quality is there like it used to be but yeah. in arizona you know if you're if you're not particular and you know, I've kind of got a different philosophy and, and you guys are probably, well, you're always five steps ahead of me, but some of these units that people, okay. 15, 20 years ago, people would, uh, would, uh, uh, you know, just draw a tag and go hunt for the opening weekend and then right. come back on the second weekend. And that was it. Well, now it's so hard to get a tag and, and all these trophy hunters put in for this specific unit, you know, nine, 10, three C one, whatever. And, um, they, they hunt the whole season. Yeah. All of them hunt the whole season. Yes. And they're all looking for a trophy bull. So my, where I'm going with this is some of the lesser units, you know, the unit four or five, six, sevens, Mm -hmm. uh, eight, you know, they don't get pounded by the trophy hunters. They're just the guy that wants to get drawn every three or four years. Yeah. And you know, there are some monster bulls in those units because they're not hammered as hard by the guys that really know what they're doing. Well, so anyway, you can draw other tags that were you, uh, well, look at, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't you go down Adam this year or was it last year? This year I hunted for 15 minutes, unfortunately. It was all, (laughs) you know, well, that, that That shows you how good your state is on air, but that really pisses me off. (laughs) Well, Hey, it's after some of these years I've been through, I, I took that and ran as that bull was coming in, basically trying to run me over. It was almost self-defense. I just said, I'm probably not supposed to say what unit, but didn't you, weren't you 27? Yeah. It was like a gift the whole time. My son was 16 or 15. I took him down there. We hunted the solid two weeks and never saw a bull as, as big as one. Well, we finally did on the last day and, and we ran two miles and he actually killed it at seven yards. But my point is with his bow, but my point is we worked our butts off oh, in that yeah. unit and you stroll up and, and the elk probably thought, oh, geez, that's Adam Bronson. No. <laughs> I better just go. I just better go commit suicide. Well, <laughs> whatever he did, I'm glad it happened. Yeah, it was. Well, it was a, never gotten, had something that, like that happen to me. I, you know, I'd been down there scouting for, you know, a week or so prior to that and got the lay of the land. But just one of those, if you do it long enough, something like that is going to more or less jump in the back of your pickup and say, I'm going Oh, yeah, just like that, whatever, that 90 inch antelope jumped in your back of your truck the year before. I don't know. That was with a a rifle. Randy, Randy, where are you coming up with these? Don't do that. (laughs) That was a rifle. I had a rifle. You know, that's cheating, remember? That was a, yeah, that was a special bow. That was a rifle, but the long bow. But he, you know, that 27 has gotten better with the burn and everything else that's going on there you know oh my gosh well it it, uh you know if i and i think i know 
probably the general vicinity of where you hunted just because of, of your description. I mean, I grew up right there. That's where I grew up. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the elk have, have, have kind of moved down and around and into yeah. all that country. And uh, everyone wants to hunt up in the, you know, in the aspens and, yeah. the, and the fir trees. And, and you know, you drop off a little bit and, and you get away from the people. And, and uh, that burn got, went all the way down there. And that feed is just fantastic. And and I, I'm sure you pro- – well, no, you were only there for 15 minutes. You should see some <laughs> of the coos deer in that country. Trust oh, me, I, I, I saw a couple. I'm going he back. Sent, he sent I'm a going video back. clip, and I'm like, really? And I'm like, like, look what I saw. And then the, here's the thing about it. It was when I was down there scouting. So it would have been early September. The over-the-counter archery hunt was on. And I, here I – the first animal I had in my 15s, there's this coos deer. And I'm like, okay, I should have got a deer tag because the hunt is on. <laughs> like you, can, and, uh, and you can run up to spring or yeah. grab one. And I thought, you know, I've only killed two of those in my life with What's both with long-range yeah. rifles. What yeah. are the odds? Yeah. I'm even going to – yeah, I, I'm kidding myself. Let's just keep looking for elk. You know, yeah. that's what I told myself. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that's where I grew up hunting mule deer. Mm-hmm. And when I was a kid, and there was a lot of mule deer, and when I was a kid, you shoot a 160 buck, that was a big buck. That burn comes through, and all of a sudden, there are 180, 190 inch bucks running around in that burn. Oh. It is un- yeah, we've unbelievable. Seen it. We've seen a few trail camera pictures. Well, and then, uh, you know, you've seen it, I'm sure, Randy, in all your other states, you know, whether it be Utah, or Nevada, I mean... You get Burns some of these wild fours and fowls, and two to five years after, when that feeds yeah. just enough mature, man, it it's can do rare that a burn stuff. doesn't produce big animals. It's rare. Well, I, you know, I that's why, uh, that's why <laughs> in June I'm out there throwing matches. <laughs> you <laughs> are not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just jacking. But boy, you know, it doesn't really hurt. Well, it does hurt your feelings, especially if homes are involved or timber is involved. Yeah. But that juniper country in Nevada. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Let it a all lot go. Let to hear about go. a burn o- over there. The juniper country swallowed up so many big deer that we never see again. I I just I don't have any affection for, for junipers. junipers. No, <laughs> none. No, that's right. But, but well, let's talk about uh, Randy and Adam. We're the hosts of this. I don't understand why Randy's putting you on the spot talking I, about. I, it. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, don't know. You know let's uh, talk about some of your giant you know, you, bulls, They talk Randy. about certain kinds of envy. Yeah. <laughs> right. I see Whatever. A picture and I get antler envy. Well, it's envy. like we all are. I we mean, Bronson s- shot a, uh, oh, uh, sh- shot a uh, stone sheep. I don't know when you shot that. It wasn't that long ago, I don't think. That was a rifle. That, that, was, was, again, a hog. that was again with a rifle, Randy. You probably got one of those I, just cares, like it with Randy. a bow. It was Randy. with a howitzer. We need to give Randy. Like we need to get ones. Randy a long range rifle and make him go with us. We need to break that break that uh, myth of uh, <laughs> hey, I can't do this because well, you know, what others funny, will say. Uh, I spent, uh, geez, I spent like I said, forty five days up in the high country this year. You know, I'm not a spring chicken, and uh, you know, most of those nights, you guys know how it is. You're up there and you're sleeping on the ridge and. And, uh, you know, when you get to be a little older, you, you wake up in the morning and things are a little stiff and you're going, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, road hunting down in Mexico, sitting on a high rack with a high powered rifle sounds really yes. good right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. So it. you guys might, you guys might see me, uh, you know, you might, might see me with a smoke pole here at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that'd be good. Open sight. Well, well round you yeah. a little bit. Open sight, <laughs> round ball, black flintlock, right? Maybe we got to make it just as hard, as, as primitive as a muzzleloader can get. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's uh, let's talk about some of these giant bulls, Randy, and, and you don't have to say specific numbers, but I, you're like, I don't know how many giants you've killed, but it's been a lot of them. And, and you've done it in multiple states, not just your backyard, but you've done it in uh, Nevada and, and other places. And so... Um, just kind of, let's go through that a little bit, like, like, you know, calling them versus just spot and stalking them and not calling them or how are you doing it? Like what, how does Randy Ulmer hunt giant bulls besides obviously you're scouting, but, but once it comes to game time. Well, and you know, you talk about elk scouting and, and to be honest with you, um, um, I scout, I, I used to scout everything and I used to scout everything as much as, as my uh, schedule would allow. And I've become maybe lazy. I, I like to use the word efficient. Uh, if I don't think scouting is going to do me any good, I, I don't do a lot of scouting. So uh, let's say uh, you draw an Arizona elk tag. 
Um, to be honest with you, scouting um, does you very little good. Yeah, they're going to rut. It's going to change. I I found that the bulls I found in July uh, or August, uh, early August, weren't there come September. They were somewhere else. And now it's been proven uh, with these guys that put out all the salt and all the trail cameras. Yeah. You know, they'll they'll have a trail camera picture of a bull, say, in Unit 9, right up by the park. And then they'll kill him in the early rifle or the, the archery hunt. And, you know, he'll be in unit seven, which is, you know, 35, 40 miles south. Um, and it's happened over and over again. So my point is, uh, at, you're, we're talking about elk and big elk. And what I found is I go up, it depends on, you know, the season changes every year. As you guys well know, it kind of moves a day back every year. Yeah. Uh, and so depending... I don't really start scouting until the 1st of September uh, because then the bulls are probably going to be in the place they are. And, and yeah. I go out and I'd, I'd really like to spend a long, lot of time out at, at night listening. And then uh, if I hear what sounds like a good bull, I'll try to meet, memorize bugle and then look at him in the morning and uh, try to figure out, uh, you know, if he's a big one, then I've, I've got his bugle memorized and then I can hunt him. And that's actually how I've killed a lot of my big bulls. Um, but that's my, and you, you also talked about, do I call, don't I call? Uh, I called, I used to actually enter calling contests uh, back in my 20s and early 30s, and uh, I was never any good at it, but I still entered the calling <laughs> contests because I wanted to get better at it. Yeah. But my point is, I used to call and call and call and call, and I would call in uh, good, bull, decent bulls, call in yeah. decent bulls, but I'd never get, those big bulls just didn't respond yeah. You know, and you, you hear about guys calling really, really old age class bulls in, but mostly it's on public or private land or Indian reservations, or they just get one that's particularly dumb, or maybe they're just a lot better caller than I am. But when I started calling, as soon as I stopped calling, I started killing big bulls. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my number one, um, <laughs> I guess, my number one uh, uh, thing that just, just kind of opened my eyes and go, oh my gosh. So making I too much noise and calling I pretty much, much yeah. I have never called a big bull in. I've never killed one of my big bulls. I just I I mean these guys are nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old. They've heard everything, yeah. they've seen everything. And you know, ninety percent of the time or more than that, if I hear a call, I can tell you if it's an elk or a hunter, even yeah. a good cow call. Yeah. And if I can tell what can you imagine yeah. what an what a big bull, an old bull that's been shot at a few times? So anyway, I, I've completely quit calling. I, I don't call at all. I carry a reed in my mouth though to stop a bull before I shoot him. Yes. but that's it. Well, and what we've found too, as we thought a lot about it, is is you know if you're a trophy hunter like you are, and you're you're looking for a particular animal or a particular size of animal or whatever, you'd have to call in two hundred bulls to find the kind of bull you know, that you're willing to kill, especially a guy like you that's that's killed, you know, every kind of bull there is. And so, you know, versus you glassing them and, and working the country that way. And so you just can't call. There's not enough time to call that many bulls in, even if you were calling in older age class bulls, which, which like you said, is, is nearly impossible. Well, yeah, what the, the, the problem is, is when you're calling, the vast majority of time, is you are going to spend your time on the bulls that answer you yeah. and the bulls that answer you aren't the ones that you want to kill. Yeah. Um, so you're working these other bulls. And again, I'm talking about, you know, hunted, uh, heavily hunted or at least fairly heavily hunted public land. Um, you're just not going to get the bulls you want. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, well, for instance, my son killed a, a, a really nice bull in, in unit one, oh, three years, two years ago, three years ago, uh, with a muzzleloader and uh you know what i and i'm always preaching to my kids as you are this is what you got to do you know you're trying to of course they don't believe any yeah. of it they <laughs> they don't think dad's anything yeah, special right. anyway <laughs> so but one you know it's kind of funny when they they have listened to you and they actually uh, uh, spew some of it back at you you're like oh my gosh he did listen wow. we're, we're hunting these these elk and and there was oh geez it was a really good year and there were 10 or 15 bulls um bugling in this basin and and uh and we're you know in there two hours before light and we're following the the big herd and and uh all of a sudden the, the one of the kind of the groaners i'll call them yeah. kind of separated out and went up to the left and all the other up went up to the right and so 
I'm following all the other elk and, and my, and my son says, dad, you've always told me when there's a bunch of bulls like that and, and one of them separates out or right before dawn, he said, and if it sounds like a good bull and he's not bugling very much, you follow him. Yeah. yeah. And I thought to myself, but I just wanted to get him an elk. You yeah. know, I wasn't really worried about a giant. The biggest, we, yeah. follow, we followed that other bull and he only bugled and just kind of groaned every 15 minutes. Once it got light, he almost shut up. Anyway, to make a long story short, we got up on that bull, and it's one of the biggest bulls I've ever seen in my life. I mean, a net, a net, net 400-inch bull. Come on. Oh, wow. yeah. And, well, here's here's that. That's the good part of the story. The, the sad part of the story is uh, uh, we were in this Aspens, you know, those those baby Aspens after a burn. Oh, and, yeah. you know, they're Jungle. 10 feet tall, and yeah. it had been raining all morning. And I actually had the muzzleloader in a plastic bag. Uh, black plastic bag and and when we got close to that bull i took it out but we we're still going through those aspens so that bull came out stuck his head out at 10 10 yards and was looking all around so i got to look at every point he owned and every point he owned was pushing 20 inch, yeah, yeah 24 inch fours i was Jeez. dying the magical well, finally he stepped out and my son took aim at 10 yards and click <laughs> oh. that's why you hunt and with the a bow that's jumped. why you hunt with a bow right there you you would have well, killed it go i've never had a i've never had a a, a powder get wet on a bow yeah that's yeah. right Wow. Anyway, so but, he got away. Yeah, I guess, obviously. It's kind of funny, you know, you, you teach your kids certain things and, and, you know, believe it or not, occasionally they listen. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, you know, you describe, you know, normally not hunting some of our archery elk hunts in Utah and a little bit in Nevada, I think it's the 25th or so of August. Our, our hunts in Utah start early. They're 28 days long, but, but they're really early and, and we're really high on hunting the opener for the reason you described earlier. You can find a bull before he leaves within that maybe first four to seven days of our archery hunts but but as you described in a lot of units in a lot of states you don't start hunting them till september do you find yourself and maybe it's hard to do a quick analysis of the giant bulls you've killed or most of them or most of them are lone or you or they got some cows and whatever number and you're just simply slipping in their bedroom quietly not calling and killing them that way or are they truly alone and they just haven't really got rutten hard yet here's what i've found and and it, it's happened to me over and over again and and i tell myself this is true and then i'll quit believing it until i do it again and and uh and 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 and, and it, it 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 really is true but what has happened with me is exactly what happened with my son and you know i you guys probably know because you've hunted so much but but it's very, very difficult to do. The first really big bull I killed, uh, the first 400 inch bull I killed, I, I, uh, I, I was, that's a long story, but, uh, I knew there was a giant bull in there because my buddy had seen it the year before. And then, uh, uh I talked to another guy that had seen it. it. I mean, it's really a special bull because it's, uh, it's inside spread is like 50 inches. I mean, it's a Jeez. wide bull. It's actually, yeah. it's inside spreads 50 five inches 56 something like that Jeez. it's unbelievable but really big bull anyway um i i i followed this bull from before light just just bugle and again other bugles were going on and all the other elk went the, the, another way and he, he he went a different way and anyway i got long story short i got in front of him he came by me at 35 yards i shot him but but uh um then when I shot that really big bull, that Nevada state record bull, same thing, you know, I'd seen that bull. Uh, well, to start off, you talking about scouting bulls ahead of time. This is before I, well, not that I know what I'm doing now, but I really didn't know as much as I, I think I know now. And, and I went up there to Nevada and I scouted and scouted, and scouted and scouted and scouted. I mean, before the season and I had three bulls located that I thought would go Boone and Crockett. I mean, yeah. this is in the heyday of Nevada and they're all up high, you know, they're all way up high and, uh, different in different places, you know, they were all within 10 miles of each other. So I thought, well, I'm going to go after that one. And then that one, and that one is not my, my number one, my number two, number three. And, you know, this is, uh, oh, it probably be, have to be like the 25th of August. I'm going to say I could be wrong on that date, but, uh, by the time the season started, like five days later, all three of those bulls had absolutely disappeared. Mm -hmm. And, and I was like, wow. So, uh, 
you know, this, that scouting did me absolutely no good. And I talked to the game warden in that area. And he said, yeah, you know, he sees bulls, those same bulls, and they'll be on one mountain range in August and they'll be on a different mountain range running in July, yeah. you know, 25 miles in away. September. I mean, in, in September. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but, but uh, where I was going with that is, is during that hunt, it, I think it was a 21 day hunt. And I had seen a really big bull midway through the hunt, but hadn't been able to get on him. And, and so I found him again. I found a whole cluster of bulls bugling, you know, three hours before light. And so again, I, I, uh, I, I, this one bull had a particular bugle and he separated out about an hour before light, separated out and went a different way. He would only bugle every 15 or 20 minutes, even though it was dark and he kind of had a groan. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to follow him. And so I followed him and, and he would only bugle every once in a while. I was in the real thick pinion junipers, all the other elk had bugled and gone the opposite way. Anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up sneaking up on that bull and killing him. And he, he was that one that ended up being the art, the uh, Nevada state non-typical record. So then my point with all this is what I have found is these old, old, old bulls that are dominant. And this is, I mean, there's nothing scientific in what I'm telling you right now. It's just my feeling. I think what they do is they're so dominant that um, they go into the cluster at night. You know, I'll call it a friend. I call it a frenzy. They go into the frenzy at night, check all the cows. If, if, if there's a cow in heat, you know, the other bulls will either fight him, but he can take that cow or they've already fought him in the past and they know just to leave him alone. He gets that cow, takes it off. Um, and that has happened so many times to me. Well, <laughs> this year, my the same son, Levi, had a uh, had another Arizona elk tag. That kid gets, well, you know, <laughs> you guys know the system. He, he was the youngest grandkid uh, on both sides. So he's got so many. He's had seven. He's Mentoring right tags now. He's and He's had stuff? seven Arizona Jeez. elk tags. Yeah. And he's Crazy. killed seven big bulls. How old, well, is, anyway, how old is he? He's no. 18 right now, and he's got seven bulls on his wall. Uh, well, the last two bulls he killed were 397 and 391. Come on. Um, oh, Dude. you don't trust me. It drives me Chip crazy. Chip off the old block right there. <laughs> well, no, he's, he's just, he's he's got something. He's got something special anyway. He shot four arrows at elk in his life, and he's killed four giant bulls, and they've all died within sight. Oh, my god! But anyway, my point where I was going with this is, well, that bully killed this year would be 391. It has about 12 inches broken off its fourth. Anyway, uh, he he followed this herd of elk. Same thing. First thing in the morning, uh, there's 20 cows maybe, one 350 bull, and then there's this really big bull. Well, the big bull pulled right out of the herd all by himself walked a mile and a half and Levi trucked along right behind him and and the kid's really sneaky I mean he was in those elk he was in elk all morning till whatever eight o'clock in the morning never spooked an elk and the big bull goes into a cluster of juniper trees and Levi sneaks in there after him and I'm thinking oh this is not going to end well um because you know I figured the bull was going to bed and when they bed it's so hard to mm-hmm. sneak up but they don't have anything to do to look for you and and I'm up on a mountain two miles away maybe maybe three and uh, all of a sudden i see that bull come squirting out of those trees and i thought ah, that's what i knew was going to happen and it was the la- second to the last day of the season and uh watch that bull go about 40 yards and all of a sudden he just started wobbling and tipped over backwards i'm like oh my goodness <laughs> yeah. but my point is is he left the herd yeah yeah and he was bigger and stronger and just a, a just a much more dominant looking bull anyway than that other bull and then at night the night again they'll go back in and do it again i just i think those older bulls they're not going to waste their time managing a herd of cows no they do i mean that's they a want. lot of work yeah yeah that's I can not see what they're what really you're... after i can see what you're saying they pretty much do what they want exactly you mentioned so, you mentioned scouting oh go ahead no, no, no. I, that, that was my whole point is that these bigger age class bulls just, you know, they come in, they take what they want. And uh, they, if what they want's not there, they'll leave. They'll come back tomorrow night and see if it's there yet. <laughs> Crazy. You mentioned scouting, you know, and, and spending a lot of time early and whatnot. There was a time in Nevada I drove by you, um, and I think you were you were on a main road, but you were in a chair glassing with the big eyes. 
and uh, oh, yeah. and I and I'm sure you remember the exact time I'm talking about, <laughs> but uh, but because you've done it so many times, I'm you know. But tell us a little bit about that as far as your glassing techniques and and uh, and just spending time behind the the glass. Well, my wife thinks I have an obsession. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll let people. You can you can have my bow. You can have my truck you can have my quad you can borrow anything you can't borrow my wife but you can borrow almost anything i've got but you can't touch my optics yeah. <laughs> i i've been an optic fanatic for oh geez 30 30 35 years since the size 15 by 60s came out yeah. um i love optics uh it's just fun i mean that's what i spend all my summer doing is just sitting behind hiking and then sitting behind binoculars so yeah i've pretty much got every good binocular that's ever been built and i don't hardly ever get rid of them either i mean what they've done in the last few years has just been phenomenal with the optics um you know you guys have all the different optics you know what i'm talking yeah. about it it's just phenomenal but i've got everything i mean you know uh, i've got Swarovskis, I've got Leicas, I've got Doctors, I've got Koas, um, and I'm sure there's a few name brands. Yeah, there's a ton <laughs> but, of good uh, stuff. Yeah. My wife threatens to cut me off. I said, "Hey, you know what? This is this is <laughs> this is my, one of my only obsessions other than hunting. So it's it's good. And they're <laughs> so related. My, yeah, they go hand in hand. What I spend all my extra yeah. money on. <laughs> Absolutely." Yeah, well, good. Is there so? Let's say a guy wants to do what you're doing. I mean, which is which is impossible. But let's just say a guy wants to, you know, do his best to kill a big bull or or whatnot. What would you, what would you tell somebody? Like, what would you tell somebody? This is what you need to be doing. Obviously, applying in the West and whatnot. But but is there some kind of advice you'd give people? Yeah, first of all, I think the most important thing is if okay i'm I'm just going to talk bow hunting right now yeah but let's say okay you want to kill a big bull, bull and, and really i think bow hunting is probably one of your best bets if you can become proficient the, the last thing you want to do is let's say you're an arizona resident okay it's going to take you 15 years to draw a really really good unit well the last thing you want to do is 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 go there either hire an outfitter or um or go on your own and not know what you're doing so my my advice is go hunt in as many states as you can. Become a good elk hunter, yeah. and in the meantime, start accumulating. You know, get some 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 good uh, application services. You guys know any uh, that can uh, <laughs> that can uh, put you? Yeah, put you into. Uh, oh, by the way, congratulations on your first year of your magazine oh, uh, the thanks. anniversary. That's great. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, uh, put in for his. Uh, um, you know, put in for these states, put in for Nevada, put in for Utah, put in for uh, for all these different states where you can get a good tag. And then when you are able to draw it, you're not going to be novice. And I see this in Arizona. These guys wait for 10 years to get a tag and they really don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And, and, and not because they're stupid. It's just because they don't have any experience. Yeah, experience is the only way to teach. And yeah, you got to fail a lot of times. Yeah, I spent 20 years chasing elk for it. Well, 15 years chasing elk hard before I finally shot a big one. It's because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And, and you know, it seems easy when you're watching, well, when you ask you guys on video, but it it's not easy. Yeah. You know, it's really not easy. And then, and then last of all, if you get a good tag and you truly want to shoot a big bull, you can shoot a little bull. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. if you, if you want to shoot a 350 bull, which I think is an incredible elk, that's my problem. Then, you know, you're going to have to pass up a ton <laughs> of 310 or 300 to 320 bulls. It, All right. So let's, but what, what if we want a 400? How do we, uh, we're going to have to pass yeah. up the 350s, which are you know, phenomenal it's, it's bulls. To be on a true, a true 400 mm. gross, officially scored gross bull is so rare. I mean, I will bet you in the state of Arizona, Not, I'm not talking about what you see on social media, but I'm talking about an officially measured <laughs> two or 400 inch bull. Yeah. It's so rare. I mean, it's so rare. I really, I think the odds are so far against you. Yeah. Um, I, I really do. I, I think it's almost a, um, it, it's almost a fantasy and how it can happen, obviously, because, you know, it happens to people every year, but 
but those bulls just don't hardly exist. Um, if you do want to shoot one, first you better become very good at hunting elk, and then you be better uh, be able to either and even I mean landowner tags. There really just aren't any. You can hunt uh, a private ranch, but it, even on a private ranch in Utah. A four hundred oh, yeah. so rare. I mean, really, it's almost a unicorn. It's just you just they just sometimes happen. Or you're hunting in a spot yeah, like exactly. you said. There's, you you get a tip it, from a buddy. He saw one, and then all of a sudden, boom! You or one of your family members draw the same unit, and you have a starting place. One you, thing you're leads hunting to another, and you got to hunt a specific one or two animal. elk, yeah. and that's what you're hunting. You're not hunting elk. You're hunting an elk. Yeah, that's e- exactly. And you better pass up every elk. And and what's going to happen is you're going to see a three sixty bull, and you're going to you know, you, you're going to fold like a taco and that's and me. Shoot it. <laughs> that's me. I'm the taco folder. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yeah. Or you got to pretty much, you know, to, you know, take the entire season off plus a week before whatever. And, and just live there, which is just not possible in mo- for most guys. And then, and then well, it's not, not possible. Be, not plus, be the taco. So it, it really, do you, do you want to, okay, let's say that there is a 400 bull in your unit and let's say that you have a 10% chance of killing that bull. Now, in a, in a unit that has a 400-inch bull, there's going to be, let's say, 10 or 15 in a decent-sized unit yeah. bulls that are 360-plus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, do you want to take – and let's say the biggest bull you've ever killed is a 320. Yeah. Do you really want to pass up all those 360s, no, which you have a 70 or 80% chance of killing at that 10% chance of killing a 400? That, that's where you really that's, get into a dilemma. That's now, I grew up in Arizona. I, I, I got completely spoiled because I got good tags and Back when there were, were those kind of bulls yes, out there. And yes. so for me, it's a different question. If I go home without a bull, um, you know, so what? Yeah. I, you know, so what? You know, one of us, well, somebody in my family is going to get an elk tag and we're going to get some elk meat. Yeah. So that's not an issue. But, but you know, but for somebody else that's never killed a, a bull that they really could be proud of on their wall – to, to wait for a 400 is kind of foolish in my opinion. But, and it's like, yeah, but it's also like if somebody were telling you right now, there, you got a, there's one bull and there's a 10% chance and, and listed it out for you. You wouldn't even hear that, Randy. You wouldn't even hear it. You're going to be like, Where's I'm going to take the 10%, give me the tag, give me three weeks. And that's where I'm I'll at. I'll take my chances. And, you know, and that's what I think guys did that for Yeah, but for I'm Mule psychotic, for... just like you guys. Well, it you is psychotic, but the psychotic guys. Are, most people aren't as nuts as, as you guys are. Right? <laughs> yeah, and you? I am. It's just, yeah, it's and that's natural. my. I mean, and, and I think it's that's. It's by the grace of God, we're not in the crazy house. Well, uh, we should be. Uh, but but it's that's why guys like you are, are doing what you're doing. And, and there was guys for Mule Deer I had, um, I, I always wanted to kill giant bucks. And. And, uh, you know, I had some of the, what I would call mentors, you know, tell you, you know, it's not the eighties, it's not this, it's not the sixties, fifties, whatever. And, and it's not possible. And I just kept saying to myself, like, they're dying of old age somewhere. Like they're dying of old age. I'm not going to take that for an answer. And, uh, anyway, and so it does, you just, well, you are, I mean, if you, since you started talking about yourself, let me talk about no. you a bit. <laughs> no, you, no, seriously. <laughs> nice segue, <Brutal>. Jason. <laughs> no, 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 you are, you are a phenomenon. You're, you're not natural um, because what you've done in the last 20 years uh, with a bow, well, with any weapon, really, that the deer you've killed are just, it's just not. It it really you, you you've done it. You know Randy, you could say, Randy, well, Randy, listen, no, you, no, we're talking it. about you right now. But <laughs> the thing is, is is really you can't. You know, you asked me about four hundred inch bulls, but you can't take, say, a twenty year old kid, however you were old you were when you started shooting yeah. those monsters. You can't take a twenty year old kid right now, and and blow smoke up his skirt and say you you could do this. He can't. Yeah. It's it's like I mean it's like taking a, a kid off the high school basketball team said you can be michael jordan yeah. you know you've got a special set of skills you've got the time you're working in the hunting industry yeah. uh the variables you find the variables you're good at, you at kind of everything and you have the time and you live in the right country and, and all these different skill sets that you have it's just you know it's yeah. it's kind of like winning the lottery to be in the position you're in and have the skill set you have yeah. so you know again going back to that 400 inch bull i just I just it it just I cringe a little bit to to uh, 
to, to to have someone wanting to try to do that uh, because I just hate to see him disappointed. Well, I want to try. I want to try. Jason and I talk all the time. <laughs> I want to try, but I got to give up Mueller and I got to decide when that is <laughs> for 20 yeah, years. That, and it might yeah, happen like once that. in 20 years. It might. Yeah, like that's going to happen. But, you know, you live in Utah and, and, and yeah. you have connections and, and you know where those bulls live. And seriously, in Utah, uh, I believe that if you waited long enough and, and, and got a good tag, and I think your odds are probably better in the bow hunt than any oh. other. Well, I don't know, not in Utah. You guys' season an early dates right. suck. We got an early archery. It's okay. Yeah, your bummer. season dates suck. Yeah. But uh, I think it's possible there because, you know, I say all your limited, well, I'd say, and you guys know this better than I do, but I'd say the top five or six or seven units that you guys have, have the elk have 400 inch bulls every year. Yeah. yeah, it's le- it's not like it once was. Kind of like when you were talking the heyday of Arizona, the heyday of Nevada, like early two thousand in Nevada. I mean, there was nothing like it, and you remember that like it was yesterday. Um, and it's good here. It's just not as good. And but you're right. They're still killing one or two on each unit yeah. a year. And speaking of which, I, I you guys have to tell me where to go because I can draw any unit right now in in uh, Utah uh, except San Juan, I think. I may be close to the San Juan, so no, we'll talk later want, about that. You don't want that one anyway. We'll talk later. Yeah, we can do it. We know a good outfitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we and we and we, uh, you know, you non-residents can put in. We can't even put in for out. I, I was looking. I don't know. I just got on. So I started social media about two months ago. I had a young kid. <laughs> got me started on Instagram, and oh my gosh, that was the worst thing I ever did. All I did is look at Instagram. That's well, addicting. And you know, you the, thought the you were addicted thing, to hunting. It's nothing you to guys be addicted make to your me, phone. <laughs> You know, I, I hope you guys realize that you make every other hunter in the West out there feel inadequate. I mean, I've hunted for 40 years out West, and I've had a, a, my fair share of success. And I look at – well, share. shoot, I look at Adam In two Bronson, months. Just, in oh, yeah. Fair just share, his, Bronson. In two, in two months, pictures, he hasn't posted all of I his thought, giant bucks. Oh, my that, God. I remember. <laughs> I remember when they started. How many sheep did you guys kill this year, Adam? Well, well we're, talking about you, we're talking about you. I'm going to pull that card right now. We're talking about Randy <laughs> Omer. So I remember – Within a month or two ago, all of a sudden, oh, Randy's on Instagram. And it was not daily, multiple times a day, giant Individual after bucks. giant after giant. And we knew, and, and, and I, we can't keep up of them, and we're still proper to the point, you still haven't used all of your material. So you're not even caught up with you, what you've already well, here, killed. Here, for example, five days ago, Randy Ulmer's, Randy Ulmer's account, Randy Ulmer, post, posted three monster bucks. Three monster bucks right there with a bow, all with a bow, and and I'm sure he still hasn't pulled out all of his all good. of his giants. We're and he's 89 we, posts into it. We still haven't seen the well, good I stuff. Was, uh, <laughs> I have to tell you a funny story. A friend, a friend of mine, well, the same friend of mine, Steve Winter, uh, his son had a, a, an Arizona unit one tag uh, archery, and and uh, his 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 dad's uh, was working and and he, and he couldn't come down. His brother was working, couldn't come down. So he's down here all by himself. He's he's a young kid. What young? He's like twenty years old. Very experienced elk hunter. But you know, just first time on his own, really away from not having anybody to help him. So my son could only hunt on the weekends. He started college. He wants to go to med school, and so he 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 could only hunt on Saturday and Sunday. So uh, in the middle of the week, I drive from one end of the state to the other to to, to go help my buddy, and. So I'm sitting there, and he's just always looking at his phone. He goes, look at this picture. Look at this picture. Look what they just got in Utah. Look what they got Jeez. here. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. He, I said, you know what? My son's opened a Facebook account for me, whatever, six or seven <laughs> years ago, but I never used it. Yeah. And uh, I said, can you teach me how to use Facebook so I can look at all this stuff? He goes – he, he said his exact words. Facebook's for old people. He goes, you got to get, you gotta <laughs> gotta get, get Instagram. on Instagram. Yeah. He says, also, you don't have to talk to anybody on Instagram. Yeah. All you have to do is look at pictures. I said, hey, that's that's more along my intellect there, yeah. looking at pictures. I can do that. <laughs> so he, got, he hooked me up on Instagram in about 10 minutes. And so I just started you know, Cutting posting. loose. I, yeah. A few family pictures, but mostly just what people really want to see is just your oh, hunting yeah. pictures. We're, we're all like, here he is. He's found it. And well, uh, every, every day, happen. every day we pull it up. Of course, like every single other hunter out there, and we're like, all right, who's killing what? Because we're going to the office, strapped to an office desk, and uh, just wondering who's having a good time out there. Well, so. I wonder how many productive hours uh, in the American economy how bad the American hey. economy has suffered because people are looking at pictures on Instagram. All, I know. All I, I know, know is personal. 
my personal <laughs> workload is has gone way down because I spend all my time looking at your guys' pictures. Oh. All I know is Adam and I get the same amount of work done now in two hour two two good work hours that we used to get in ten. So we're pretty proud of ourselves, really. Not only <laughs> well, do we get the same amount of learners. <laughs> not, <laughs> not only do we get the same amount of workload done, we're also scrolling Instagram. Eight out of those ten hours. <laughs> let's uh, as we started in on these giant mule deer. Let's transition to that. You've uh, first. I want to know what your favorite animal is to hunt. Second off, I want to know how you're killing all these giant bucks. The stalking. I know you've sat with bucks within forty yards, or who knows what we're going to hear the stories. But for you know eight plus hours, rainstorms. You've you've experienced it all, and so kind of want to transition into that. But uh, but first off, what is your favorite animal to hunt? Oh, definitely mule deer. Now, if you ask me that, you know, it's been my favorite animal to hunt since I was a kid because it's really what I started hunting mule deer and elk. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, our family, just like you guys, back in when I was a kid in uh, Arizona, you know, we got off school opening day of deer season, which was always on a Friday. And so, you know, we grew up hunting mule deer. So it was mule deer, but I hate when I started bow hunting. I hated mule deer. I hunted them more than anything else, but I hated them. Because they win. Got to see they is, win. All I ever got to see was their ass running away, away from me. And for 20 years, you know, I, I figured out elk. Not that I figured out elk, but uh, I've kind of got a little bit of a handle on elk uh, 15 years before I got a little bit of a handle on mule deer. And so for those 15 years, I would have, if you would have asked me, I said, well, geez, elk is my favorite. Well, mule deer was still my obsession, but I hated them because I couldn't kill them. Well, yeah. I could kill a buck every year. Sure. I just couldn't yeah. kill a good, I, I couldn't kill an older age class buck. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's why you want, want, want one more the next year. That's what it is about mule deer. And then, then you factor in the whole scarcity for lack of a better word all the states they're harder to come by than they were in the 70s and 80s and so it just which uh, is part of the addiction though. yeah it's, it's make, really part of the yeah, addiction. what you can't have is what you want the most and well anything that's uh, rare is valuable no. uh, and that's not original to me but it's true anything that's rare is valuable and, and big meal they're rare but and, uh, and especially difficult to get and you can go buy a big elk uh where <laughs> well, no, on, on <laughs> where Let's you guys it. must be making a lot more money no i just want to know where so we have something <laughs> no, to look forward to, to. You can go to the wall of pie to have a soup pie yeah go to the san yeah, carlos go. but even and, those randy i know guys go every year and they're shooting 370s and maybe it's because they're not willing to they're the taco they're folding you know maybe they're maybe it's just because they're not willing to eat a tag i don't i don't know yeah, I don't know either, but you know, like I say, well, you know, you say 370, you guys are very jaded. A 370 is a giant. You go to Colorado no, and you know. start talking about a 370 bull, and you're talking about the state record oh, for that I year. I know. Yeah, we know. Yeah, I know. But I, I'm just that 400 inch goal. But let's go back to Mueller. So you you hate them, but you love them, and it's part of part of the game. It's just the the more you get your butt kicked by by Mueller, the more you want to hunt them and and uh put your hands on a giant and so when did you well, just let's go back in time a little bit when did you get serious about mule deer when did you harvest your first giant what do you well, remember? i was really serious the whole time <laughs> <laughs> they, they they didn't know that i was serious because i didn't hurt any of them um <laughs> but no i i think i shot my first uh, you know this is almost a shame because you know i grew up in arizona but i killed my first uh really good buck in utah on the um um, on the book cliffs. book cliffs, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it was only cause he was really dumb, but that was in the nineties. And then, um, you know, it, it, once you shoot a nice one, you get and kind of get a little bit more obsessed cause you think, Oh, I can actually do this. Yeah. And you actually give yourself false hope, but really it kind of <laughs> cascaded from there. Um, I, I started focusing more on them and, uh, and uh, and I kind of learned a bunch of things that I well, <laughs> you know, you may, you guys have been through this. Well, you, your learning curve is a lot faster than mine, but you, you, you kind of do this. You make the same mistakes over and over and over again. You oh, yeah. finally figure out, you know, you're just like, really, am I this stupid? I have to make that mistake. I can't do that again, again. <laughs> and again before I finally figure out you got to stop doing this. So really, it was by reducing, not doing the not making all the mistakes that I used to make. And gradually you're like, okay, you can't make all those mistakes. Uh, 
you can only kill a buck if you do this. You can only kill a buck if you don't do that. And and so it was a really gradual, long learning curve. But then once you learn what you can't do and what you can get away with, all of a sudden it becomes it doesn't become easy never, it, but it becomes easier. Yeah. yeah. So you're and you're you're primarily you talked about your optics earlier, the spot and stock. That is your that's your bread and butter way to hunt mule deer. I mean, that's, I mean, that's how we hunt mule deer. It's how I like to hunt mule deer. I like to have, not that you're in control, but I'm not a, I'm not a tree stand hunter. I, I did it when I was a kid a few times, probably because my dad knew, just told me stay here. And he knew he could find me again, you know, if I didn't get out of the tree or the blind, but yeah, spot and stock, um, having a unit where you can use your optics, hopefully watch a buck until he hits the dirt and then it's game on. That's how you, I mean, that's your, it seems like that's how you're hunting mule deer, right, Randy? It is. I shot one mule deer out of a blind. I've never sat a tree stand. Uh, you know, for me, hunting's always been my fun. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it seems like it's not fun, but it's always been my fun. So, and one of the things, to be honest with you, if, if you were to take away my hunting or my scouting right now, I would probably, for just for big deer, I, yeah, I'd probably let you take away the hunting because I get to spend whatever, 40, 50 days scouting every year and there's yeah. no one in the mountains. You got it all to yourself. It's beautiful. There's no pressure. And then hunting season comes along. It's all public land. And, and it's like, oh my God, here, you know, here we go. Yeah. We're off to the races. Yep. And then I got to keep a up a bit of a yep. competition. Yeah. Um, but no, that that's how I love to hunt because I just love glass them up. I love the country they live in. I love the physical aspect of it. And I mean, almost every deer I kill, um, well, in, in Colorado, almost every deer I kill, you know, I, I backpacked in and, and, you know, I'm, I'm by myself or, you know, I got my, my nephew, Zach on the other Ridge, uh, and he's the one you really guys should be interviewing. He has killed some so. giants. He has. In the last six years, he's killed six bucks. If you average their scores, there'd be well over 200 and, and uh, he is a stone cold killer. But anyway, but we always hunt together. I, you know, I, I have the luxury now, and and that was uh, one of my goals in life is to be able to get work and family positioned so that uh, you know I can spend so much time scouting. I finally positioned myself where I get a lot of time scouting. So I go up every year in Colorado and and you know try to you know I I really spread myself out. I always like to to. Uh, I like new country. I like exploring. And so I, I spread out and look at all these different units and try to find it. If I, we try to draw tags, but you know, you can always turn it back in Colorado. And then, and then yeah. if I find a big buck, try to get a landowner tag in that unit. But I always try to find two big bucks and I have for the last, whatever, yeah. six, well, since Zach started hunting, uh, was able to, to get off and start hunting with me, uh, six years ago, you know, we found, I found we've killed, uh, geez, uh, you know, I found two big bucks every year and we've pretty much killed them. Jeez. Um, and, uh, you know, Zach's, uh, Zach's kind of benefited from that, but I told somebody this year, I told several people, I said, you know what, you know, it's, it's time to, to hand over the torch. I mean, he's kind of, I think yeah. he's, I hope he's not listening to this cause I'll deny every word of it. <laughs> I'll say you guys coerced me into it, but I, I think he's, uh, he's probably the best shot in Arizona right now competitively. And so he can out shoot me now cause I'm getting a little wobbly. He can out shoot me. He can out hike me. He can out glass me. He can, yeah. he can, uh, he's the he next predator. Me. Yeah. He's the predator. Well, but the only thing he, that I have over, over him is I have patience. He has none. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that he, he's, he's developing patience and yeah. he'll probably get better at that, but I've got much better patience than he does. Well, and but. speaking about patience, tell us about, just give us a couple of these stories. I know, and, and I've just heard through the grapevine, so I want you to verify, but that you've literally sat hours upon hours upon hours on de- on bedded bucks in Nevada and, and different things and maybe a little bit on how, how is it easier to kill these giant bucks in Colorado? I mean, Nevada kicks my butt, and, and but I love it, but I it, it's hard on me. And I'm, so I want to know the difference because I haven't. You know, I would like Colorado. to see your trophy room if Nevada hadn't killed your butt, <laughs> kicked your butt. Yeah, me too. Because me too. Right I might have a good one. You've killed in Nevada, <laughs> and if that's kicking your butt, then you are completely spoiled. Well, I, well, I just want to know. I, I, a, I want to oh, know. Well. Am I mi- what am I missing in Colorado? And, and not that I'm. But what are we uh, missing? No, Colorado. I'm Colorado always hunting the rut. Adam and I are physically. I, no, if you if 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 I was to give like if, let's say if one one of my good friends said I you know I want to really kill a, a good deer. Yeah. Um, I'd and he he could go to Nevada where you and I hunt or where you used to hunt and where I try to hunt. 
um, and he said, uh, you know, should I go to Colorado or should I go to Nevada? I'd send him to Nevada every time. Yeah. Uh, and here's the reason. Colorado is incredibly physically demanding. And, and not only is it physically demanding, uh, it's mentally demanding because, you know, we don't realize, those of us that do this all the time, we don't realize the, um, let's call it the fear factor. It's not really fear, but it's the it's the getting up in the high country and then and then yeah. just the overwhelming feeling that people get and they just want to go home. Yeah. Uh, especially if it's physically demanding or if it's wet and cold or if they get hungry or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in Nevada, you know, for the most part, well, you pretty much going back in the middle of the day. It's a long your trailer. Day. You got the air day. conditioning on. Hundred degrees. And yeah. air you know, conditioning's you, freezing up. Now it's blowing warm air. It's just a, it's a miserable <laughs> cycle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, damn it. You know, <laughs> that, damn it. The, the ice melted in the cooler. Yes. My sodas are my sodas are warm. Every time. Of <laughs> course, you guys don't have beer in, in Utah. I know. No, so, we yeah. don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you forgot the snakes. So snakes. Nevada snakes. is just a hunt, and and you know you can go over there, and a lot of units in Nevada, you know you you're gonna find a 180 buck. You're yeah. just gonna find yeah, one, and yeah. so you're gonna. Have, now Colorado, you, you take the same guy, and and you go up there, and you say, okay, we're backpacking in. You know, we're gonna backpack in until we get one, and you know it's gonna rain on you. And you're up twelve thousand feet. You know, it's there'll cold. be a skip of snow every once in a while. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, here sleeping this sleeping this one man tent, which I don't like and, tents. Yeah, and so <laughs> and, and so, but the but just he's going to get altitude sickness. Um, you know, well, I about half the guys end up getting a little altitude altitude sickness. Bronson, he nauseous. is trying to keep us from going to Colorado during the archery season. No, you guys would do great. <laughs> I'm talking about you know, I'm talking about your you know your 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 average human beings. Okay. You know, you guys are kind of like superheroes. Uh, uh, and you got superpowers. Getting, getting deep, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, no, but anyway, uh, no, Colorado is just tough. Now, now there are a lot of places. Like a couple of years ago, I found a buck down in the Sage, and you know, I drove down the highway. Yeah. I got out of my truck. You I hunt them where they're at. Half a mile that day. <laughs> yeah, you hunt them where they're at. If he's gonna That's let you right. hunt them uh, half care. a mile oh, off no, a road, I, I don't care. I, uh, I don't care. You where know, I at. found <laughs> I did find that deer again. A friend of mine was driving down the highway. He'd been at the bar, and it was two o'clock in the morning. He's driving Come down on. the highway. Come <laughs> on. Almost hit this deer, and he knew I had a tag. He called me up and said, "Man, there's a deer on the side of the road." Anyway, did you uh, kill that deer? I did. We I, we could only find that deer every few days because he's in kind of some thick stuff, and he was pretty smart because he he lived close to civilization. But no, you talk about hunting where you find him. I mean, I have no problem. I have no problem wherever, wherever. sleeping, sleeping in, a, in a camper. I mean, I've been there, done that. I don't need to freeze my butt off. I yeah. I don't need to be miserable and hungry. Uh, I'm just kind of greedy for big bucks. I'll just hunt them wherever I find them. Let's talk about your tennis shoes. Every time I think about Randy Elmer, I think about tennis shoes and stocking giant bucks. And what is he thinking? That's what yeah, we're, well, you're the first, first we one. Were, and yeah, then, that's what I mean. And, and then, then after like, about 10 giants, I'm like, I'm going to get myself a pair of tennis shoes. <laughs> well, <laughs> so how did you come across that you, idea? I haven't had a pair of tennis shoes on. Come I've on. killed a deer in 25 years. Really? Uh, I, I'm always in my socks. Yeah. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. No, well, maybe I, just I, all no, the kill pictures. You, I was. Uh, I've always been a. Well, until my, until my frequent uh, knee surgeries, I was always a, a long distance runner, and actually until my late forties, I was. Uh, you know, we did those twenty four hour adventure races competitively, and so I've always been kind of a mountain runner. Yeah. And um, so, when you if you stick a boot on my foot i feel so clunky yeah, yeah. Um, the only time i'll ever wear boots is if, if i if if i think there's going to be snow and snow that actually stays because you know if you i always my tennis shoes are always oversized so i can get a couple pairs of wool socks in there and really uh a couple pairs of wool socks and snow for a half a day is no big deal yeah. so i don't unless i think i'm going to get sustained snow snow that's going to stick on the ground i always wear tennis shoes it's just i'm so much more nimble i can go so much faster Quiet. and as you guys well know especially if you're hunting now sometimes you got to really ski down to, yeah. to, to get it done and and uh, i was watching a video of you guys i don't know when i think it was chris that was uh hunting uh an elk i think it was in 
uh, Nevada with a rifle. It was a John. And, uh, been you John. guys were running oh, through the that woods. That was John in Southwest running. Desert. Yeah, oh, we ran. It? And you guys are running through the woods, and you were smoking it through the woods. And you I were. thought, and they could run a lot faster if they had tennis shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. So how many pair do you take on a typical hunt? You can't just oh, take Oh, my one. gosh. Uh, now you're getting into my my, you know, you're, you're, you're invading my privacy. This now. is the secret I sauce, have, well, Andy. We, have, Randy, we have, have not mentioned pairs, and here's what? the reason: how many? What? Fifteen. I can take fifteen. <laughs> On a I hunt. have a, an action packer, Ben, one of the big ones, and it's full of tennis shoes. And here's the reason: and um, what, what's that? It's full of tennis shoes. It is full of tennis shoes. They are all black. XA. The same model, everything size. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Solomon, just you just find a right XA, and a left Solomon every morning, because, and you're gone. Come no, on. no, because here's the deal. Nothing stinks more than your feet. And and these guys, and, and you guys may be guilty of this, but, um, you know, hunting elk, well, hunting mule deer too, but specifically elk, their noses are incredible. And, uh, you know, I see guys, uh, you know, they put a fresh clothes, set of clothes on every day or whatever. And then they put the same old boots on and they put the same old leather belt that they've been sweating on for six years on and i think oh my gosh are you serious you can sniff their belt and it you know it smells <laughs> oh like rancid gosh. sweat well anyway here's the, the deal I, I don't wear leather belt i don't wear leather or anything but um i, I have a fresh set of tennis shoes for every day of an arizona elk hunt which is 14 days brand new and and so what i do is every day i've got fresh tennis shoes i've got a big bin of socks i have fresh socks i have a fresh set i have uh, 20 sets of camouflage clothes and and so I don't have to go into town to do laundry in the middle of the hunt. He's like one of and, them wives that you know when they have a closet for shoes, a shoe closet. Yeah, Randy's got yeah. that for his, his hunting tennis shoes. He might be one that, of the only guys that that his shoes outnumber his wife's shoes. Yeah, in the closet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good yeah. point, Bronson. Yeah, yeah you're, you're. Women right. are known I, you know, for I, shoes I, and stuff. I keep the fact He's that got I, several I addictions. My... I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> listing them out. We, we got hunting. We got optics. I, now I, we're into I shoe addiction, sock addiction. In the back part of my closet. <laughs> I don't yeah. want my friends to see. <laughs> Jeez. And so, are they new shoes, or let's say you get a pair of shoes? Are you washing them? Are you putting? Uh, some kind of, you know, baking soda on them. What, what are you doing? Well, no, what, no, what I do is I, you know, I wash them with Tide Free uh, at the beginning of the season. And then like after the end of one hunt, I'll take them all and uh, put them in the, you don't want to uh, put them in the dryer, but I, I just, I wash them in the washing machine and I take them out and put them on, on the patio where the sun shines and let them dry that way. And then, and then every morning when I, when I, I, I get up, um, I actually do put probably three or four tablespoons of, of uh, baking soda in each of my shoes before I put them on because your feet just generate a lot of smell. As You're you guys talking well, three or four tablespoons. That's a lot, right? Oh, it is. Okay. It I'm is. just making I sure. Mean, I and and right. it actually seeps through. I mean, you can see it kind of crusting on the like outside. Sand. Of the just shoe kind of come, permeating the shoe. Just comes. Yeah, permeating the shoe. You know, especially if there's dew on the ground, you'll see it. So you'll if you need a, out. if you're early one morning and you just put a fresh pair of tennis shoes on, and you want to check the wind, you just kick your foot up in the air, and a little bit of that powder floats out. And you <laughs> <just check it. laughs> That's a good point, bro. It's, hey, it's, your dual purpose. It's my wind checker. Yeah. yeah there you go. There that you go. that's <laughs> taking it to the next level. Okay, so you've spotted a buck. You bet him. Do you stalk them before you before they bed? I mean, just I know what I like to do, but let's hear what let's hear what you like to do. Glass you of know, buck it's up. All, it's and and I know you hate this answer, but it's situational. Yeah. Um, backing up a little bit. Um, one thing that I do that 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 I get arguments with people over and over again. Not arguments, but they disagree with how I do it. Uh, and I'm kind of a one trick pony. I, I really, it's taken me so long to kind of figure out how to do it yeah. that I don't want to vary my routine very much because I know what works. But uh, the one thing that I do is, uh, you know, I used to say, okay, years ago I th said, okay, it's going to take me 20 stocks to kill a mature bull, buck. Then, Boy. you know, it's gone down and down. And, and one, the one thing where I'm going with this is the one thing that I do now that is probably one of the most important things that I do is I don't stalk a buck unless I'm almost certain I can kill it. Now, now 
when I say I'm almost certain, so many variables come in, you know, you spook a doe or whatever the wind changes. I mean, but, but given, given that the circumstances don't change, I don't spook a deer, another deer, a hunter doesn't come over the hill. I don't stalk a buck unless I'm fairly certain I can kill it. And yeah. again, that's for, that's because I'm lazy. I, I, I don't want to wait two or three days for that deer to come out again. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've got so many days invested in that particular deer. Yeah. And that's one of the hardest things that has been for me to teach Zach uh is no <laughs> you yeah. say no we're watching not this morning after that deer right now you are not doing this you're not doing that uh and that's why i say patience is so important but so so really i wait till that deer's in a position and and you know that really big non-typical i killed in nevada you know whatever 10 years ago um that deer would not get in a when and he was well he's really big and so and he was you know on the edge of a burn um and I knew if I spooked him, he'd probably go in the thick stuff and I'd never see him again. So I, I laid on that deer for four days. Uh, when I say laid on it, I was just out there in striking range, you know, within 300 yards or however far I thought I could get away with him not smelling me if the wind changed. And I just waited and waited and waited for him to get in a good position where I thought I had a really good chance of killing him. And finally he did. He yeah. finally went into a place where I could kill him. And I, I, uh, zipped in there. It only took me about 20 minutes to get in there and I whacked him. Um, that's my point. You know, if you're hunting one deer and if you got him to yourself, obviously if, if a bunch of other people are hunting him, you might have to take more chances, but this particular deer and, and uh, most of the deer that I'm hunting are, are far enough back in that I don't have a lot of competition. So, um, you know, I, 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 I usually am extremely patient. Wait for the deer to get where it's, whether it's, you asked me originally whether I wait for them to bed or not. It depends. It depends on whether they're, if they're bedded over in a place where I can slip up on them and, and uh, I think I can sneak in on them and shoot them in their bed. I have no problems with that. Yeah. Um, I, I have no problem with that. However, uh, if, 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 you know, if they're not in a good position, uh, you wait for them to get up to feed, and then you wait till they feed in a good into a good position where you can. That get you up get within them. seventy yards or something, and wait for them to get up and feed, and maybe they move toward you or come toward you or whatever. And no, I'll never get that close to a deer. And wait without, without knowing you're going to kill it. Yeah, without no, without knowing that without the wind's good without, and he's you yeah, can kill him. Yeah, right where I, he's I, at. Well, that's I, what I, I. I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. I've killed you know the deer some of the deer i've killed i mean if you've got a solid wind that's not going to change i i i personally get cl that close I yeah don't well I've, I've just had too many bad experiences where yeah the wind's perfect 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 and all of a sudden you know in the mountains especially well yeah. in colorado yeah, you close. can't do it because mm -hmm. you're straight up and down and you know how those mountain winds are now in nevada you know you're hunting more in the desert in nevada where the winds are more consistent because you don't have those really big uh mountains yep. strong uh, where the wind will come around and and uh you know it's kind of like a i compare it to a uh you know to a stream you see a big rock in the stream and the the, the for a long ways past that rock the the water's kind of swirling around now you know you get a flat with with no structure in the bottom of a, wow. a, a stream and it's just going to flow smoothly and where you're where i'm seeing you hunting in nevada for the most part is kind of more deserty yeah, and it's sure. not yeah. as likely yeah the totally wind's going to more than likely in the middle of the day be steady and, and it's not that case well, in sometimes yeah sometimes it's you know on perfect high pressure systems it's a lot harder because you swirl a lot more but if it's yeah you got sometimes you're on the end of a front or or right at the beginning of a, some kind of front coming through and you just get 20 that real 20 mile an hour stiff yeah wind. and then they're dead like you've you've really got a great opportunity there. Of course, stuff happens, and you bump a bow, uh, a doe, excuse me, or something. But anyway, those steady winds like that can can sure help a guy. Oh, geez, yeah. Then you then you've got then you've got time, and and that's what usually screws something up for me is if I'm too close to a buck for too long a period of time. Yeah, their senses are just too keen all the way around to. Yeah. You know, something's going to go wrong. One of their buddies is going to get up and walk over to you or a doe is going to move in, you know, or, or an elk's going to walk over there or a horse, you know. Yes. hundred yeah. percent. Is there any other tactics you use when you're, when you're, uh, archery deer hunting, killing, killing these giants? Um, uh, you know, a couple of simple things, but, uh, I think they're important is, is, uh, especially, you know, when you're hunting in steep country is using a, a, 
a uh, a um, rangefinder that's tilt compensated uh, because you know up till they kind of till they came out with those uh, it was really difficult and guys would always miss it shoot over deer all the time yeah. so I always carry a tilt compensated rangefinder. And I will never shoot at a deer um, without ranging it. The last deer I shot without ranging it, probably shouldn't say this on a <laughs> podcast, but I uh, I had bought one of those, uh, I think it was Swarovski, that only went down to 32 yards, That's 34 a yards. Swaro EL 10s, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I had yeah. one of those. And, and I thought, geez, if I can't range, if I can't tell, you know, what a deer is, it, you know, at 31 yards. Uh, yeah, I yeah, agree. Exactly. There's something wrong with me. So, Anyway, I had shot this buck, and uh, I thought I'd made a pretty good shot on it, and I had. It was it was a good shot, but I was, it, I could still see him. He even went and bedded down. I thought, you know what, I, I just need to go shoot him again. So, and it was in a great position. He was bedded down, and I could come up with this little rim rocket. Oh, geez, it was I figured twenty or thirty yards, something like that. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I, oh, I uh, I snuck over there and I tried to range find with my Swarovskis and it wouldn't give me any distance. So I thought, well, geez, he's under, 30. you know, it's, it's, it's under 30 yards. I'll just use my 20 yard pen. Yeah. And I, I still to this day don't know what happened, but uh, I put my 20 yard pin on him. <laughs> and I, So that's, this is the only time in whatever, 15, 20 years I had didn't use range finder on a deer. And I thought, well, geez, he's got to be 20 yards. And you know how it is when you're looking straight downhill, it's really hard to judge a yardage. So, yeah put it right in the middle of his chest and shot and uh, hit the ground right in front of him. I thought, are mm-hmm. you serious? For mm-hmm. some reason, either the range, I probably, I was trying to, you know, how you peek your head up over the, the, the hill and, and, and it was hitting and five yards in a rock or something. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your range finder is actually hitting a rock five yards away. So it's not registering. Well, the deer was probably 35 yards away. And uh, anyway, so my point is with that, well, he just jumped up and he was sick. So he jumped up, stood there. I got to shoot him, but uh my point is don't ever shoot a deer and i'm talking about ever with <laughs> without range finding without range finding him first so that that's one of my big tips because people get excited and they think oh geez i gotta shoot him right now i don't have time to range find you're much better off taking the time because even if he does you know walk away you'll get another shot at him again and, and you might as well use the technology that we have to your yeah. to your benefit how do you uh how do you control your nerves on giant animals like uh, who not, told you i control my nerves well i don't know <laughs> you're kill, you're killing them you're killing so. maybe your nerves aren't in your fingers maybe you burn those nerves that run to your fingers and your arms so you're not shaking too bad but tell me about that like how 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 do you make you know, it happen if i were gonna if someone were to come to me and say you know i get really buck fever really bad and and how can i cure it well you, you can never cure well i suppose some guys can i can't i, I still get a little nervous but Really, it's not – if you start telling yourself, I'm not going to get nervous, you know, you can't control your emotions. However, what you can do is learn to shoot well in spite of your emotions. And the way I did that is is, uh, by shooting tournaments. You know, I shot tournaments for however long, 20, 30 years. uh, And, you know, when you're shooting in world-level competition, you are just as scared as you are when there's a buck when you're shooting that last day or that shootout or whatever – and you're still going to be very nervous. But what I've found is, is you can actually teach yourself to, to be extremely nervous and still shoot well. And, and, you know, I, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but, but you really can, um, but it takes a lot of practice. And, and what I would suggest to people is, you know, go out and, and shoot competition. Uh, you know, you don't have to be good to shoot competition. You can shoot competition and not be very good at all. Yeah. But you've got to make the competition count, you know, whether it's betting your buddy 10 bucks on a shot or whatever. You know, you have to – there has to be something at stake. And it might not be as, as intense as it is when you're shooting at a big buck, but it still teaches you how to perform. Uh, even when there's a lot of pressure and, and that's the bottom line is is performing even when there is pressure and once you've taught yourself that it becomes a little more instinctual so everything is is happening whereas a lot of guys they just melt down because they haven't practiced I- anything that that uh, creates that same sort of anxiety yeah yeah it's hard to duplicate that anxiety 
Yeah, when it's, well, you can inches. never duplicate that particular yeah. anxiety, but you can get close. Certain you can, anxiety. You can have the same yeah, sort of things, and you or... can learn. Okay, and then then it becomes really uh, like with a target archer shot. You know, you got the whatever five, ten steps of of shooting a good arrow, and when you go through those steps in your mind as you're as you're shooting. Um, really you're going to be shaking a little bit more but as long as you you can actually shake quite a bit i know because i do it all the <laughs> no. time you can shake quite a bit and make a really good shot yeah if you maintain good form and the problem people have is they don't maintain good form when they are nervous and if you can maintain good form when you're nervous you can still make a good shot what uh since you brought up the steps i mean can you just blurt them out real quick like what are the steps to shooting a good arrow well, you know, everyone has a, a different series of steps, but, you know, for me, I've shot competition for so long, I kind of skipped the first few steps, which is put your hand in the bow the proper way, okay. you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, draw the bow back a certain way. And then, of course, you anchor. And those steps have become, and for guys that have shot a lot, those steps are kind of, the steps that are extremely important to me are, are you shooting the right yardage? Do you know the yardage? Are you using the right pin? Yeah. And and I know this sounds simple, but I have used the wrong pin. I have not picked a spot. I've shot at the whole animal. So pick a spot, use the right pin, make sure that you know the yardage. Okay, if it's, let's say it's 43 yards. Okay, are you using your 40 yard pin? Yes. Is it gapped one third of the way between your 40 and your 50? Yes. Okay. Those are huge steps, yeah. huge steps. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I tell myself, patience, patience, because what happens for me, and I'm imagining it probably happens for most people, is you get a 200-inch buck in front of you, and there is some sort of anxiety deep within your psyche that wants you to shoot because you've waited your whole life for this moment mm -hmm. and that buck's going to run away. You just know he's going to run away. It, it, something's going to happen in the next three seconds if you don't get that arrow off. So they yank the trigger. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's those steps plus patience, 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 squeeze that trigger, patience, follow through and, and you're done. Um, very good. But, you know, those, it sounds very simple, but it's not, well, when those you, when your brain's on fire. Yeah, when you're sitting here and in December, they're good to talk through, and then uh, you got to do it because in August, when he is staring at you and yeah. he's about ready to swirl, it, you're right. You have to follow him still because your your body takes over from your brain a lot of times. Well, and I found that well, you let's... spend you spend three months scouting and and hunting and and whatnot, that, and it all leads up to one moment. You know, it's very important that you've got those steps down, like what you're saying. Just if that's, I mean, you've got months and a lot of gas money and tag money and anything else that goes into the hunt hinging on on uh, execution. Execution. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, you asked me what's important. And, and one thing I didn't mention, or I, I mentioned just briefly, is patience. One of the, and this is going to sound really silly, but one of the things that, that I do, uh, and I think one of the things that's helped me a great deal is uh, when I'm hunting, I actually have this little saying that I use over and over and over again that, you know, I tell myself, and, and it's silly, but it's patience seldom goes unrewarded. And, you know, with mule deer especially, not so much with elk, but with mule deer especially, uh, I can look back at, geez, almost every big buck I've ever killed and think how patience has has allowed me to kill that buck and then i can look at all the ones that got away and i can see how a uh, lack of patience cost you that caused me to screw that up so you know just you know what you do not have to kill that buck right now you do not have to kill that buck in the next hour you don't even have to kill it today you don't even have to kill it tomorrow yeah. but something inside of me just screams that I got to get this thing done. You got to get it done. He's right there. Good grief. He's huge. He's been what you've been waiting for for the last five years. Yeah, yeah I want him now. And you just have to make yourself be patient. Don't yeah. do anything stupid. How have you found, Randy, uh, some of your bow hunting styles or methods? How do they change from the different states you, you're hunting? From the strip 
to Nevada, maybe they're somewhat similar in those states, but from there to say Colorado high country, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's easy to say, kill them where you find them, you know, all those types of things, but there is quite a few differences. And how do you, how does your patience change or does it depending on, you know, the terrain and where you're at and all that? Well, we'll take, we'll take, well, let's just take Nevada and, and Colorado. Okay. In Nevada, uh, what typically happens um, is your buck, you're finding your buck early in the morning. Uh, you know, you're hunting in the, in the summer, it's hot there. And those bucks might be out for five minutes after it gets light. They may be out for two hours after it's light, but one thing, and you're oftentimes finding them a mile or two away. So, you know, I'm talking about patience now in Nevada, in those situations, you find one of those bucks out in the burn, you know, and he's, he's a hundred yards out into the burn and you know, he's going to go back into the thick junipers and that's it for the end of the day until the end of the day. Well, patience goes out the window right there. Yeah, <laughs> You're running I'm to the running, tree line. Yeah. <laughs> I'm literally running as fast as I can yeah. to get in position. And then, um, uh, and then once I get in position, uh, you know, in the edge of the trees. And then all of a sudden you click from, you click from, you know, a hundred miles an hour to a crawl. And then, and then all of a sudden patience comes into effect. You know, you kind of have to know when to run and, 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 and when to crawl. And, and, uh, that's hard because once you, what's really hard for me psychologically anyway, mentally is, is okay. I've ran all the way down here. Let's say it's a mile and a half. I've got down here. Dad gummy. He's still out there. He's still out there. Yeah. And then just to go boom to like, okay, I got to move like the hands of a clock right now. Cause I'm actually where he can might see me through these trees. It's really hard to make that transition. Um, then you talk about Colorado. Now, Colorado, a lot of times uh, where I'm hunting, the deer might just go into a little copse of trees or they might go up into some rock uh, or occasionally they'll bed right out in the open. And so now it's a different game. You've got, you know, you've got all day to kind of to get over there, get in position. And, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, and you guys know, it, of course, but a lot of people don't realize, you know, they get up in the morning and they go out and hunt in the morning because that's when the deer are active, of course. And then they get up and, well, they go home, take a nap. They don't do anything at noon. And, and then they go out again in the evening and, and hunt in the evening. Well, I don't know if it's because hunters only hunt in the morning or the evening, but, you know, if you spend a whole lot of time with older age class deer, you know, you're hunting, say, one deer and you're watching him all day, or at least you're watching the country he's in all day. It is remarkable how much time these older age class bucks spend in the middle of the day up and feeding. feeding. Yeah. Nobody's out there. They do. It Nobody's shocks, out there. And there's deer standing right out in the middle of the open. And you didn't yeah. even see him that morning because yeah. he wasn't in the open. And it's like, seriously? Why didn't I know this 30 years ago? <laughs> no, uh, it's true. For the it last is. 30 years, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been sleeping in the shade when these big bucks are out feeding. So anyway, my point is when I'm in Colorado, I'll wait. I'd say half the, I'd say a good half the deer or more than half the deer I've killed in Colorado. I've killed in the middle of the day. Yeah. I just get on them, sit there. I don't get on them, on them, but I get within striking distance. Uh, the winds are so variable up there i don't ever get to where depends on how long it's been since i've showered like i've been backpacked up in there for four to five days and and i i smell like an old pair of gym socks i i uh i won't get within 500 yards of them but but you know if 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 that's my first day out and i showered that morning I, i'll get within 300 yards of them um but then i'll, I'll be close enough to strike and when they get up they'll get up you know, usually not before 10, but 11, 12, 1, somewhere in there, they're going to get up and they'll feed for a good half an hour at least. And boy, they're so vulnerable because they, they're so relaxed. You know, they, they've, they're, they're in some craggy place. They've been able to look at all the country for the last six hours. They've been bedded down and, and they are just so relaxed and they stand up, they start eating and, and they don't even look around there as much as they do in the, in the morning. You know, they just, true. they just kind of, oh, yeah, there's nothing here. I'm just going to eat. And there's no hunters out yeah. at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And they're vulnerable. Just like you said, I think what you're saying is a hundred percent true. hundred percent. Absolutely. Seen it. 
Yeah, that's crazy. And so what do you think you're, uh, I mean, a third of your bucks you kill in midday, half your bucks? Uh, in Colorado, I'd say a good half of them are, are from 10 o'clock to, uh, say, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Let's say you don't. And, and, a lot, and you know, that, that may not just be because they're up and feeding at that time half of it is in colorado it takes you so dadgum long <laughs> to get, get to where they are yeah. you spot them and you know it could be a it could be a four-hour hike to get over to where they are yeah you know what i'm saying yeah and so you just happen to get over there and that's you know you you're finally over there and, and that's when you kill them yeah that's crazy you got any crazy crazy fun stories for us whether it be hunting bears with tommy hoffman or or <laughs> dirt, <laughs> or dirt. Uh, you know tom is a known liar i hope you realize that oh we know <laughs> okay I, I, uh, well we just want to give you the well, opportunity you know, to set it Tom's straight the only one you talk to because i've got a lot worse stories than that or dirt okay. I, I don't know we got uh, this is uh tom, okay tom hoffman for those of you that don't know tom hoffman he's like my bow hunting hero he's i think he's killed every sheep in the whole world with his bow um <laughs> Just a really good guy. Anyway, yeah, so Dirk Eddy invite Tom Hoffman and I up to Alaska. He goes up to Prince of Wales Island to hunt black bears. I'd never hunted black bears. I thought, you know, something I'll do when I'm old. I'll, I'll sit in a tree stand and hunt black bears. But, and I'm this hot shot target archer, right? Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I go up there with Dirk and Tom. We have all sorts of fun. I mean, we're catching. Oh, my gosh. You're eating crab legs every night because, you you know, you set out crab pots in the morning and and we're eating halibut. We're catching halibut. We're, we, Jack Frost, Tom, and I hiked out into this lagoon. You got to hike out this place where they used to have an oyster bed. We're plucking these oysters that are, oh, they're 12 inches long. And, and, and you know, we're frying them up in butter. And oh, it's that, that's not part of the story, but it's a, a very cool experience. But anyway, sure. this, where you're going with this. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're is, talking, not us. We, we're not so talking. So Tom anymore. and I, Tom says, hey, uh, can I bid you? Uh, let, let's go up to the stand. And I said, yeah, 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 no problem. So, we climb up in this this uh, tree stand, uh, you know, we motorboat out there, you know, in the ocean, and then we climb up in this tree stand, and, and uh, Dirk had been up there, you know, for several weeks, and he had been baiting, and so we're sitting, and this tree stand sits 10 yards from this bait, <laughs> and and first of all, <laughs> first of all, it was very cold, <laughs> it was very cold. And this giant he's already black setting up the story up the for yeah, the yeah, excuse for the cold. ending. <laughs> yeah, we've heard a couple of versions. Of, of, they of were very George. close to each other, so <laughs> kind of reminds me of George on Seinfeld. It was very cold. Do they know about shrinkage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not where I'm going with this. But it was very cold. Okay. And so anyway, I'm sitting in this tree stand. Tom is in the tree stand directly above me. I mean, his feet are kind of you know at my head, and. uh and uh, this big bear starts coming in. We can see him coming in for a while. And he's a big bear. Yeah. And uh, he's basically at eye level with us. And then he has to kind of come down this little hill to come to the bait. And I'm just like, oh, God, this is a big bear. He's right there. You talk about buck fever. But yeah. I, I did mention it was really cold. Yeah. So yeah. I, I started shaking. And I'm sure it had nothing to do with how big this bear was. But I am like shaking, visibly shaking. And this bear comes in and, and he's 10 yards away. He's positioned perfectly. His head's in, you know, head's looking straight away from us. I draw back. It's 10 yards away. I thought, you know what? It's kind of getting dark. I'm going to shoot this bear right in the heart. So, you know, he'll die within sight. <laughs> so anyway, that, that was the plan video on this. So I can't lie about it now because it's documented. But so anyway, I shoot and I, man, I nailed him and he runs over the hill. Tom goes, uh, I think you missed. I said, "Oh no, I." Are you serious? No, miss? No. <laughs> anyway, we we get down there, and my arrows dry That's as perfect. bone. Yeah, yeah, Jeez. and well, and what no one told me, and I should have realized, and I did. I got another story for you. <laughs> you like this one? But <laughs> I uh, I didn't realize, and this is my excuse, and I'm this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. But I didn't realize they had like six inches of hair hanging down. Yeah in the spring and i aimed like six inches above his what i thought was his belly line and shot right through there anyway yeah. my shaking had nothing to do with it <laughs> and i know we know tommy and, and dirk and oh, knowing those two i don't know how long that's been since that happened but i'll bet that comes up often when you guys it are... might be daily <laughs> it might i be... had 
I had brown hair back then. Uh, <laughs> That's how long say, ago it was. Those guys are characters, and they are not going to let and you that forgive that. That was before angle compensating range finders. Oh, uh, yes. There's a exactly. hundred excuses and, and, we could uh, come up and help you know, you I did not. I did not have a range finder with me, so there you I go. thought it was 10 yards. It could have been 12. It could have been 14. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> 12 or 13. Once again, you've got to always use a range finder. Uh, always. Always. Yeah. Uh, anything in, else, anything else, those are good ones. You know, uh, we got tipped off on that one a little bit. Oh, Cause no, yeah, I didn't could, know if Randy Omer ever missed. We do not have missed. time enough to talk about all my misses. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, does, you don't have that kind of time does, on your podcast. Does Randy Omer miss? Uh, you know, yes. The, the interesting thing is, is, well, I'll tell you another story. The very first time I went elk hunting with a bow and arrow, I had a six point bull coming up the ridge, walking right at me. I stepped behind a. Oh, geez, a four-foot ponderosa pine in this elk. You know, I come to full draw, and this elk walks out, stops at 22 yards. I, I stepped it off afterwards. And we're right on top of this kind of knife-edge ridge. And I shoot, and I saw my arrow go four feet over this elk's back. And I could just still remember to this day that arrow just sailing all through the blue. Jeez. <laughs> And I thought, what in the world just happened? Yeah. And I know what happened now. I just lost it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, if I miss, yes, yeah. And the, you know, I told you my brother and I had six arrows. Uh, six arrows. I think I told you we, six when apiece. we first, yeah. when we first, yeah, we had twenty two nineteen arrows. We had six arrows each. And the first day we ever went elk hunting, uh, <clears throat> this before uh, just the year before I shot at that bull but i shot it well i shot it more than six cows but i shot six at six different cows with my six arrows and they were, <laughs> they were all within 30 yards oh, and i missed every one of them i mean good thing is i missed them clean yeah. and it was so bad that i actually went back and found two of my arrows and, and went hunting and but shot you, them. Could, you could legitimately <laughs> blame it on the gear back then. I was going to say and finger and tap arrows, and a fingers. finger glove. Might not even had a glove. Might have been bare, bare fingers. fingers. I don't know. Who knows? What? You know, yeah, and I think the sun was in my eyes and <laughs> the wind was blowing. And <laughs> yeah, you're hungry. You're thinking about that. And, you're all, all and, the and I think I had the beginning of, of uh, Parkinson's or something. I don't know. But <laughs> shit. Yeah, it was not. It was not pretty. Well, you so could, yeah, Rand, Randy's missed a lot. <laughs> you guys have done about everything. Tell me, didn't you develop a broadhead there years back? Or, well, yeah, my my uh, my brother and I, you know, we've always been accuracy fanatics, and uh, uh, we we kind of independently had came up with some ideas for different broadheads because we wanted a broadhead that would really shoot straight yeah and and so many of these broadheads uh they just have way too much structure so anyway we came up with some some pretty darn good ideas and my brother uh took took one idea which is mostly his idea and 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 he uh he refined it and refined it and refined it and we were kind of talking about maybe doing it together but i i told him you know i've always avoided being like in the archery industry because yeah. i've seen so many of my friends that have you know, you, you, you get in the archery industry and all of a sudden your, your, uh, your, your hobby becomes work. So anyway, yeah, he, uh, Rusty took it and, um, developed it. And, uh, still to this day, I think it's the best broadhead ever built. Um, I still, uh, I still use it. Um, and he, he, you know, Rusty's a retired dentist. He did not want to he did not want to be involved in the manufacturing process yeah so he he let uh dan evans uh take it and 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 work with it and you know dan of course sold his company and there was a lot of other things that kind of went on so it went out of production but the good news is um i can't tell you exactly when and and, and but very soon you'll see the head out again really uh yeah well, that's yeah. awesome is it still yeah. going to be called Ulmer Edge, or is that not known? You know, yet? I doubt it. I okay. doubt it um, because it's it's uh, it, it's going to be manufactured by another company, and and but it, it will be it will be the Ulmer Edge. The I same mean, product. I, mean, uh, I actually killed my two deer this year with the prototypes. Oh, wow, um, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good yeah. deal. So. So it's, it's really good. Stay tuned, good. I guess. Yeah. Now, now I just have to, you know, I, we don't have to do this on the podcast, but Adam, you, 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 you kind of pissed me off again <laughs> in September or no, I guess it was August when you shot that deer. 
Oh, that deer was like a well, hog. I don't know how shooting one deer can make What's that? you. I don't know how shooting one deer can oh, piss you off like because that's your what was two the, or three. Or, I if, just you know, if question. people were what? to get pissed off, wouldn't we hate Ulmer by now? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, oh, but, <laughs> yeah. by the way, I <laughs> purchased both well, my bucks. You know, okay, and he's not a, shooting with 160 the pro- inch with deer. the prototype. With the prototypes, I had to test them out. So I tested them out on 200 inches. 220 inches. And by the way, I'm pissed at you. Because you yeah. killed you killed you one killed of my him. bucks, and I could have had three. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable, Randy. <laughs> what? what uh, no. What? What was the mainframe on that buck? I, that's the question I really had for you. Because I, I looked at the mainframe on that buck, and it looks like it's 210 inches. Not quite. He's he's low 200s. Uh, he's 221 the total gross, but doesn't have big eye guards. Frame, yeah, his eye guards too. are very short. You know. You know, I didn't even pay attention to his eye guards because he's yeah. got all that stuff hanging off the sides. Yeah, you know, and so I'd you rather know. take the eye guards and hang them up off the G2s. Yeah, <laughs> personally, you know, G3s. Know. I've got an eye guard fetish. Yeah. So I mean, anyway. really? Yeah. Oh yeah. I like big you eye know, it's interesting too. thing. All the big bucks I killed, I don't think before I killed them, I could tell you how what long their eye guards were. Yeah. I could tell you every point they had, every sticker they had, though. Yeah. yeah. So no, yeah. it was it was a fun no, trip. That was a... Of course, Jason and Chris and everybody was there to to to, to film it, and be there a part of it. It was. Uh, oh, you, you got know, it on film? Oh yeah. Yeah, it was. It was the a hilarious good... part. Well, I don't know how much I want to tell about Adam's story. But the funniest thing about it, he's like, he comes up and you. After you guys it. can have this archery deer, honey. <laughs> oh, we're talking about <laughs> this the is nerves. After he shot the deer, oh, nerves. the deer's dead. The deer's, the deer's dead. dead, and I'm I walked up to it, and, and, I, and uh, I'm just I'm trying to get my jaw up off the ground. It was it's one so of those. Awesome it was one of those days. Uh, the first day, um, it was one of those days you described. It wasn't right. I got about seventy yards of, yeah. of the deer, yeah, and he fed into those jungle aspens you're talking about, and. There's no nothing you're gonna do. That was it. Backed you're done. out. Backed out, and went back in the in the general zip code that night. Um, Did to, you have any competition? No. No, but there no. was just people there was around. Activity because that people well, driving on the around. On. I mean, you just have people scouting for buffalo, scouting for muzzle, scouting for rifle. You just have activity. And pretty soon they realize, oh, there's the there's Jason, Adam, and the Epic guys. What are they hanging around here every day for? And so there's that. But as kind far of as like I, if guys were to see you, yeah, Randy, in like, Colorado, you'd probably be like, there's probably a good one here. <laughs> <laughs> you, right. you know, at some point we got to do a podcast on that. Yeah, like uh, how to go uh, incognito. I, mean, I listened to a podcast you guys did. Excuse me for interrupting you, but I got to get this in. And uh, he, you know, Robbie Denning. I don't know if you remember the podcast, but I, you were interviewing. He just wrote that that good. book. by the way, yeah. that's a very good book he wrote. Yeah. Uh, and he was talking about he was talking about it, it, this recurrent dream that he had or nightmare. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's just giving me grief. Why giant buck can come up there and see you sitting there on in the truck. Here He's comes Jason. Giving... Pulls up Jason Carter at the trailhead. He's just giving me grief. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah We've all had I that thought, dream. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but, you know, you think about it and you, and you think about, uh, you know, especially you because you're involved in all the different aspects of the sport. And when they see one of you guys' face on the yeah. mountain, it's like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> There's two. There's they have a they have a negative thoughts because they think oh god he's going to shoot the biggest deer in there and then they have positive thoughts. No, that, they don't. Oh, he's in here for a reason. <laughs> he's in here because there's a really big deer here. Uh, so what I do is I park my truck in a different spot and then I borrow a buddy's. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've yes. we, we've left trucks in spots overnight to smoke screen. There's there's no. It's all. It's all above board, and I'm not ashamed of it either. You, we've smoke screened it when you had to, whether we're guiding a client or hunting something ourselves. Uh, get dropped off at the trailhead. You hike in and have someone just go park your truck over there where you think everyone wants to be. It, you it, know, that it, would be a good podcast for you guys to do is just how to be stealthy. Well, you know, we'll, we'll have you back we're on. Gonna we're going to do it, We're going to do it with you because yeah. we know. You've got to have some you've tactics. You've got to have some tactics. But, I've often wondered what the penalty is for putting another state license plate on your own vehicle because you know how they view non-residents. Like, Wyoming hate Utah guys. Colorado does not like Utah guys. I don't want to have a Utah plate. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> do, you, do you know what everyone in, in Colorado calls guys? U- Utahs. <laughs> Utards. Utards. Yeah. I know. We've heard it. I know. Yeah, Joe I'm, heard so, it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I That's call Adam that. Correct. Adam calls me that. Yeah. So we, All right. Okay. So, yeah. So, Adam, we're walking up to this giant buck. 
Oh, so we got to tell a little bit more because of, you can't just say I'm sick of hunting big deer because that sounds very spoiled, but it had been one of those days that at the second day at daylight, it was boom, barely, I could see the deer before you could barely even see. And so it was one of those game on from daylight and it was, you know, one of those all day long, you're, you're close enough, very stiff, strong South wind. So, so you got close. I was in position and then I mean, you're rain, not, you're tight with yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, within 80, 80 yards for 10 hours, the stiff wind, probably closer than you want. I know. All right. He moves the right way. He's dead. And, uh, wind could swirl, starts coming, uh, coming down rain and hell a few times. Fast forwarding, you just all that anxiety throughout all the day. He finally comes, he stands up and he feeds right to me. And this is one of those times you didn't have to, I didn't have to range him. He was 20 yards. You should always range him. I know. But you know, I knew it was a, you, I knew it was top pin low. How's that, Jason? Yeah. Top okay. pin low. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, you know I, I just want to know, Adam, you must be really close to the Lord. Um, he is. The, the reason I say that is because you walk out in Arizona 15 minutes. You shoot, you know how many, you shoot now, a giant elk. And this was Adam. You year. go up there and you have a, you have a, a giant deer walk to you. You know how many times I've had a giant deer get up and feed ne- towards never. me in my life? I've never, never, never in my life either. It's uh, <sighs> one of those times he I fed have... away all day long and to where he got in thick trees and he's out of sight from me, all the spotters, everybody. And I just had nothing but do just to sit where I was. I, and uh, I had it happen to me once. Randy, if you hunt long enough, it'll happen yeah, to you. Yeah, once. <laughs> all, all... <laughs> Adam and I both had it happen. Keep hunting there. Keep hunting, Randy. It'll happen. <laughs> so, fast forward. I shot, and uh, the deer blows out of there. You know, we see blood going everywhere, but it's getting dark, and I could tell. It was a little bit maybe like you described one of your deer a bit ago. I need to get another arrow on that deer because... Um, I didn't want to leave him overnight, even if he's dead right there. That rain it's velvet. And... <clears throat> Coyotes are going to destroy the velvet. You know, I'm just thinking, I'm like, I got to, it's one of those you just made a judgment call to press a little bit. You, you didn't have an hour and a half to wait or hour or whatever. And so after 30 minutes, I st- and there was a lot of blood. Anyway, I came up to him and uh, he, he was he was alive, put another arrow in him. But just the whole emotion of all that um, after tracking him and you're trying to beat daylight you, you kill him, you sit down, and I know you've been there. You just want to sit down there and just throw your hands up like uh, Never just again. the elation. And it's, and I just almost was like, yeah, if somebody would have offered to pack my bow off the mountain that night, He'd give it to I him. almost would have said it's yours. No, five bucks would have bought that bow. <laughs> He's like, dude, this archery, I don't know how you do it, Carter. I'm done. It's I am ang- done. And then an hour later, he's like, you know, I've been thinking. I'm, I'm There's gonna... a couple of archery tags. Oh, here. yeah. It, it, it was just, it was a moment. It was the anxiety. It's my, I, I don't manage my anxiety. That uh, The target panic, the whole closeness, you know, hearing your own heart literally yeah. beating out of your chest. And that's probably what drives us to do what we like to do so much. But that that just overcame. Well, me. and Adam's killed two hundred inch deer, but but one like this having a two hundred and twenty inch deer walk up to twenty yards, it does something to a guy. And uh, and and, and in slow motion over you know twenty thirty minutes, he's feeding my way in thick thick oak brush. And so there's I can't shoot him. I can't shoot him at forty or fifty. I'm only going to shoot him at eighteen or whatever he pokes yeah. out at so yeah. it was just one of those moments but you know what adam i, I i'm just to, to go back the in <laughs> i'm gonna get a, i'm gonna wax a little philosophical here <laughs> but one of the things that drives us to do what we do i believe is that we don't have a lot of uh true strong emotions in our life anymore you know before you know thousands of years ago we had fear we had uh, anger we had all sorts of things warfare in our modern <laughs> comfy existence we don't have that those emotions that you experience right there are overwhelming yeah, uh, they, and, are. and for people that haven't done you don't get it with a rifle i uh, you, you don't. i mean you might but it's not the same no uh, because you would have shot that deer as soon as you saw it yep. uh those emotions that you experience i mean and and you know <clears throat> carter will 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 uh will we'll testify to this yeah. once you've experienced that and and when you're in the moment it is almost overwhelming you just want it over what you said no more of this i can't stand my it. my heart can't handle it yeah but that's what you, you know feel what like. next year you're going to be going back because you know what 
it is a rush and you're going to want it again. It well, is an emotionally, you will not experience, you know, unless at the birth of your child or the death of your father, whatever it is, you will not have those kind of emotions uh, hardly ever in your life. You know, and like, like Jason said, an hour later, we were talking about what our tree deer tags we're going to draw next year. It was, it was just the, you know, that whole flood of right there. It finally well, happened. Too. Watch you're the deer for two, three, four weeks, day, like till dark. You know, just the the whole um, investment that was into that hunt and that specific deer. I had no other deer I wanted to hunt. If I had to go to a plan B, there was not a plan B I that mean, I really other wanted. There was 200 inch deer. Yes. It's a good unit. But, but, don't, don't. but, but yes, but not a deer but, that, but that you I had, had your so heart much, set in. Yes. Yeah. When do you have that much on the line, that much yeah. time invested? where a moment in a moment you can either blow it or you can have success or you can blow it yep that's you right. know other than you know making the winning basket and on your high school basketball team for the state championships you know when do you ever have that only much on the one line? five you second don't. period yeah there's they they pass you they can pass you by yeah. pretty fast one thing i wanted to ask randy a couple kind of a two or three part question a do you ever kill enough giant bulls enough giant bucks and what is left on your lift list that you haven't accomplished that you want to? You know, obviously you'll take a two, another 240 inch deer. I mean, <laughs> I, and I get that. So, is there something you really want to accomplish that you haven't, or you just want to kill more giant bucks and bulls? You know, when you ask if you've got another, uh, if you've got an, you, if you get tired of shooting big deer, or you, you're going to quit shooting big deer, uh, you know, we'll go back to the Sue's analogy. Uh, ask my wife if, if she. You know, she's got 40 pairs of shoes. <laughs> ask her if she's never going to buy another pair of shoes. Yeah. And if she buys a pair of shoes, have a bit of it. don't ask her why she bought another pair of shoes. <laughs> or she's going to look at your collection of mule deer. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, it's, God, it's just, I mean, I, you guys understand it. And most of your listeners understand it. It is in your blood. It's, you know, it's what I, it's what I really look forward to. And, and the one thing that I'm looking, that I want to accomplish is I took Zach, I, you know, Zach's dad wasn't into hunting and he's, Zach is my sister's son. Uh, he's my nephew for those of you that don't know. And, and, uh, I've been hunting, taking Zach hunting since he was seven or eight years old. And, uh, and he has just turned into a phenomenal hunter and he's been able to hunt mule deer with me. My, my sons, what well, Jake, my son's a rifle hunter. He's really never got into hunting with a bow, a bow, but <laughs> Levi, my youngest son is, is, you know real serious elk hunter and and you know elk hunting here you know um it has been not easy it's been relatively easy and we can usually get it done fairly quickly although the last couple he shot on the last day my goal is to take and, and levi has never been able to go out of state with me uh, and there are very few tags in arizona where you can go shoot a really big buck that and and plus scenery like you can get in colorado my goal is to teach levi and jake if he wants to but i don't know if he has a desire to have levi go with me when he's out of college and be able to go on these late august early september uh high country mule deer hunts he goes scouting with me every year yeah and so he really into looking at him and and uh, this year well, i got a real cool video where he's stocking up on these big bucks you know before you know in, in august yeah just, just stocking up with no bow and he gets really close to these deer and, and he was so excited and i was so excited so my goal is to get him a really big buck with his bow and he's phenomenally sneaky he's a phenomenal shot he shot competitive archery for a while and and but really just to have him up there with Zach and I uh, yeah. doing it together with us. Cause really I need, what I really am trying to do is, you know, as I get older, I'm not going to be able to get up there in those mountains. There's going to, you know, you hate, you hate to think that it'll ever happen, but there's going to come a point where I'm not going to be able to do it anymore. And Zach's going to need a new partner. So what I really like is I'd like for them to partner up and continue uh, slaying big mule deer. Yeah. So does that mean, so you've deer and elk for you is fine for the time, but there's nothing else, uh, you, know, you know, whether it be no, the sheep I, I, or, you know, you're, I mean, you're obviously very focused and, and we know that. And that's what I think almost everybody associates you with is giant bulls and mule deer, which not a lot of people that do both of those no, either. No, that, that's a lot. I'm not trying One to, of them is more than. More, more than, than most people can, can handle, but you know, you've, you, you, I'm sure you've hunted sheep and then different things like, and a bunch of other animals, but, but you're not, nothing you want to go redo and still go no, north. No, or... I've, like I've killed, 
well, I've killed uh, one and three quarters slams, mm -hmm. uh, sheep slams with my bow. Uh, well, actually, I'm, you know, one of those one the first doll sheep I killed was with the rifle years and years ago. But um, so I really don't have a desire. And if I draw, what I really want, if you guys can help me out, is a Montana sheep tag. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So there's that's, a, yeah. that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> but uh, no, really, I was before my kids got old enough that they started hunting because man, when they started hunting. I kind of timed everything perfectly for my kids. And uh, back then you could actually apply your kid for a bonus point, even though they weren't legal to hunt. Oh, I did it. And so by the I time wasted my kids those were, years. my kids were <laughs> 10 years old, they had 10 they bonus points. Yeah. Plus grandma and grandpa, mom, yeah. both grandmas, both grandpas had uh, points had, to men or uh, to them. Points. And so, those kids, I mean, when they started hunting, I mean, they had bison tags, which is impossible to get in Arizona, sheep tags in Arizona, they had elk tags yeah. every year. And so my hunting went from from purely a selfish endeavor to like, are you serious? I got to pack out another freaking elk for you guys? <laughs> um, now Slow. they're in, in, in college. So, but my point was, before they started hunting, I had, uh, you know, almost completed my super slam with my bow and and uh, really what I've been doing the last few weeks is kind of looking at the few animals I need left and figuring out which son I was going to take on each of these hunts, if they want to go, I assume they will, uh, of the remaining hunts I, I need to do. So, uh, you know, they're kind of obscure things there. Like I need to shoot a, uh, well, I need to shoot three caribou and I need to shoot a, uh, a rose of the elk. So, mm -hmm. you know, things yeah. that, that aren't that difficult, you know, relatively just got to make time and and put a, not hunt a mule deer yeah, yeah it so costs that, you a mule well, deer no, to go no, do no, those no, i find that stop. out i am not gonna that's one thing i will not forego you know people ask me well geez why haven't you ever been to africa and i'm like no. i i really i, I you, you gave me an african Don't. safari or, or or and said you can't hunt colorado high country this year yeah. i'd say you could take your africa safari and stick it well besides that there's not enough prototypes of that omer edge to to go to africa you'd have to have 40, you'd have to have 40 200 broadheads <laughs> yeah. well i personally don't have the space in my house for yeah. for yeah. any animals and 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 where am i going to put an elephant or a giraffe i'm not sure <laughs> yeah yeah no we get it well good well is there anything else randy i mean we've taken up two plus hours well, of your no, time. Uh, the only thing I want to say to you guys is, man, congratulations. You, you, you guys, you know, for those of you that just listen to these podcasts uh, and, and I wasn't put up to this, you guys have got to, you know, Jason has been helping me with, with stuff for geez, 20 years, Jason. When yeah. did you guys start? Tw a little over 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, we were even working on book, I, those I, uh, book cliff tags that we were talking about. You and I dealt with oh, yeah. clear back when you, I think you built my dad a bow I built your dad. Well, your dad wanted to get a little more serious about archery, and he, he, he said, build me a bow that I can't break. I said, okay. So I <laughs> built him up a bow with a sight real close to the riser and an arrow rest that he couldn't bend with a rock. And, and uh, yeah. you know, and I, th I think he did well with it. Yeah, I think <laughs> anyway, he did. All, I think he did. These guys have been right. doing a phenomenal job, and, and uh, God, you really need to look at their stuff, uh, the magazine. The, and congratulations, your magazine's been out for – what a year now, a little longer than a yeah, year. Yeah, just so well, we did. So we Your started podcast last been almost that December. Long. Yeah. yeah, we started the magazine December ish, and then we we listened to podcasts starting probably in January, a month later, and then we decided we had to do a podcast just because there was guys like you that we needed to learn from, and and that the world could could glean some valuable information from that you can't really put in a story format, you know. And so we you know podcasts are great because you know I listen to them when I'm doing when i'm running or or, yeah. or, or riding my bike or, or driving it's it's great yeah yeah but no you guys are doing a phenomenal job with the magazine it's looking really good looking well really thanks good. Appreciate that. we sure appreciate it and and uh and of course it's always nice to see i'm glad you're on instagram now we can see what you're killing on a regular basis without uh searching you out and quizzing you you know we get to stalk you <laughs> instagram insta stock that's, that's it that's it <laughs> so uh but you know i've been we've been following you randy for a long long time and and uh you're just a killer and there's so much that, that the hunting world can learn from you we'll we want to have you on again but we just want to tell you how much we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule and you know, for a guy like you to 
to be willing to entertain our listeners with us here for a couple hours is kind of special for us. So thanks a lot, man. We really do appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. And congratulations on all your successes this year. Uh, you know, I, I've seen more of Adams than I have <laughs> for you, Jason. Oh, it's a I'm terrible not year on you me. by not, not blowing your, your horn, but, uh, you know, Adams <laughs> been, a you know, he's kind of eclipsed you a little bit this well, year. I just oh, hate to say it. One out of 20 me. years is not, I, well, that's, that's about what the ratio is here because it was finally the year where everything lined up for us. We had a great year, took 12 sheep hunters and just took some great rams and, and uh, it was also a year I, you know, with Epic making up, I, I actually guided less um, variety. I d- took uh, plenty of sheep hunters, but wasn't spread out as much all over the place and had some more time and had these tags that I could dedicate had some, some time built to. up, like yeah, Arizona. Elk. Arizona. This was coming. It was a year I knew I was going to go this year. The archery dates were going to kick late. I had it picked three, four years ago. And just some things like that. Yeah, you don't get, you know, that was four. four 12 14 years in the making so pretty funny adam comes in the office the uh, yeah adam comes in the office the other day and he's like guys i've got a problem we're like well, what do you mean and he goes i got four deer at the butcher shop <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well and there's already been oh, about man. four put in there and two elk i don't you know I, anyway. I i think i have to call i have to call this unfair because <laughs> you know guys like jason and i you know we're kind of we're uneducated hacks and you know a guy that has a, a degree or actually two degrees don't you have like two degrees oh, he's in, a, in wildlife management probably a master's in 14 different degrees you know <laughs> or 14 exactly, different subject saying, matter is it right that a guy that's that well educated they shouldn't they should ban them from hunting yeah you know because they just yeah. know too much about wildlife it's, well, it's just not right i needed to do that to learn something it wasn't just going to be picked up on my own i had to go to six years of school to figure or something out i guess but, <laughs> anyway. oh, but, no oh, we well, guys i really appreciate no you thank you it's been great randy thanks a lot we'll do it again for sure we'll think of some new topics but that incognito stealth mode is going to be one of them next time <laughs> sounds good all right randy all thanks right. we Take appreciate care. you we just want to let everybody know uh we've got a lot of listeners out there that aren't a member of our service we we produce nine magazines a year it's monthly December through June, talk about all the Western states, drawing on skill percentages, best units, and uh, and break it down for applying across the West. Uh, we're also available to visit. We, we help guys develop uh, short-term, mid-term, long-term hunt strategies, application strategies, as well as helping you buy landowner tags, hunts, and all kinds of different things that deal with Western big game hunting. So anyway, a lot of podcast information out there. Of course, that's free and fun to listen to while you're traveling. But if you want the detailed information, join Epic Outdoors on EpicOutdoors.com. It's $100 a year, and uh, we get to visit about hunting. This is the time of year when we're not actually out in the field much. We are in the office 24-7, it feels like, and uh, just cranking it out with a different magazine and visiting with guys over the phone and, and talking, hunting, and getting prepared for the fall. If you need another reason to join, right now through the end of February, if you join, we're giving away your choice, a, uh, a doll sheep hunt to be entered into the to win a doll sheep hunt or a mule deer hunt with us, the Epic Crew, or an elk hunt here in Utah with the Epic Crew. For anywhere that joins up until till February 28th, you're entered in that. Or if you refer somebody, uh, if you're already a member and you refer somebody that joins, make sure that you... You let them know to tell them that you joined them. You'll have another name in the hat for that. There's no limit to the amount of times you can be entered or the amount of guys you can refer, but there are no way to buy tickets for this. So join in a membership or refer in somebody that does the only way to get in. So epicoutdoors.com, you can join online or give us a call at 435-263-0777.